All right. Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started here in a few minutes. If you could uh, start making your way to a, a seat. I don't know if we'll need the overflow today, but uh, just in case, we do have overflow with content being live streamed on the eighth floor. So we'll get started here in, in about two minutes. All right, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, so good morning, welcome back to day two of, of Vertex Armored Formations. Uh, we appreciate you coming back for the second day and, and we hope that you're finding value in, in the, uh, the, the sessions and the panels uh, from yesterday and, and we look forward to uh, much of the same format today. So we've got uh, panels and, and keynotes here in Voltron and then also being live streamed up in, on the eighth floor. Uh, that'll be up until lunch, and then much like yesterday, uh, once we, we break for lunch, you will not come back to Voltron. You'll go out to lunch, and then you'll, um, you'll find your respective breakout session. And at that point, it's really, you're kind of on, on your time with breakout, and then uh, we're, we're effectively closed out for, for the day. Um, so yesterday we, we had tacos. So for folks that, that are not from Austin, we had tacos for breakfast which is you know, a staple. Today, uh, thank you to, uh, to the AUSA Central Texas chapter for providing a lunch option. If anyone can guess what it's gonna be since you had tacos yesterday, today's gonna be barbecue. So Smokey Joe's, or Pokey Joe's barbecue. So thanks to uh, Central Texas chapter President Gary Patterson for, for providing that. Um, here to provide the, uh, the welcome and introduction uh, to our, our first keynote speaker is Deputy Director of Army Applications Laboratory, Lieutenant Colonel Promotable Clay McVeigh. So, um, so Colonel McVeigh runs all the day-to-day -day operations of the lab. He's got extensive background in the military, uh, trained as a mechanical engineer, um, spent quite a, a bit of his, his career in, in acquisitions, and, uh, and much of that on the uh, Army Futures Command and the Army staff um, running down a lot of the strategic budget planning for our um, major modernization efforts. So, sir, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Sean. So as, as Sean said, my name's uh, Clay McVeigh. I'm the deputy director here at the Army Applications Lab. Um, and I wanted to, to share a conversation I had with, with Jeff Rogers yesterday from COVAR, based in Durham, North Carolina. He does uh, machine learning and AI solutions. Jeff asked me, what does success look like for a Vertex event? And so that's what I want to talk about a little bit. And so for me, I think success looks like when the Army is able to share information with industry, and then industry in turn can share information with the Army, and that we can action something that comes out of that. And so I want to talk a little bit about what the Army Applications Laboratory is going to action coming out of this Vertex event. Uh, to do that, though, I have to back up a few months to September. Uh, the Army Applications Lab traveled about two hours north to Fort Cavazos, and we sat down and we had a two-day discussion with many of the soldiers within the armored formations. Uh, we met with platoon leaders, we met with company commanders, we had a battalion commander who had just come back from a National Training Center rotation. He talked about the effects that counter small UAS had on his ability to operate. Most importantly, we met with master gunners from many of these formations. If you don't know what a master gunner is, they are the career senior enlisted non-commissioned officers that have the expertise in our Abrams and our Bradley fighting vehicles. They know how to make these systems work. They know how to make them perform at their best. They know how to keep them running. And, and they are there to be the training experts for these formations. So many of these master gunners and leaders are actually here today. If you guys could raise your hands. 
You were mostly wearing uniforms yesterday. Yeah, thank you. And, and your input has been vital in providing an understanding of what we need to message to industry on what our problems are associated with the armored formation. So at the end of that two-day session, we sat down and we wordsmithed what we called our problems. Those problems then turned into the use cases as, as the topics that we are discussing in these afternoon breakout sessions. So we did five yesterday, we'll do five more today. In those breakout sessions, we have generally a representative from the Army who writes requirements. We have soldier representation, and we have someone from our science and technology um, area within the Army. They are collecting the input that we're receiving from industry specifically and, and the, uploading it into a share file that we have that we will later in the coming weeks try to condense and identify areas that the Army Applications Lab can issue a request for proposal to go after and tackle. And then uh, we'll issue that request for proposal. In July, we held another Vertex event that was focused on robotics. That July event, we, we compiled, we did the same thing, breakout session, use cases, identified areas that the Army Applications Lab could go after that maybe other areas of the Army were not working on. And we issued a solicitation on robotic breaching. That solicitation period has since closed. We're in the middle of evaluating the proposals. We get a lot of proposals for that. And we'll, we'll announce who the winner is probably at the end of January, early February timeframe. Also out of that Vertex event, we had one other solicitation um, that we've issued focused on terrain shaping. And that solicitation is open and on the street right now. So you can go look for that. Uh, please pay attention to our social media you know, feeds. We do on LinkedIn and X. We post what our solicitations are. We, post you, we point you to sam.gov, which is where they're officially housed so that you can find it. And then um, for terrain shaping and spe specifically, specifically, this Friday we'll host a webinar where you can dial in and we'll talk a little bit about that specific proposal. And then we'll offer to industry an opportunity to meet with us one-on-one -on -one where we can kind of discuss the details of the proposal as you prepare to submit what you what, think that we should do in that area. And so we'll award uh, terrain shaping probably in March, April-ish time frame, yeah, depending on how contracting takes. Um, so so that's, that's what we really do from that. So in your breakout sessions, when uh, and I had the chance to float around and listen to a few sessions yesterday, I kept hearing the, the phrase or the, the sentiment, hey, have you thought about, or hey, we have technology that we're working on that can help in that. Like those are key comments that we capture and that we use to help write these requests for proposals. That, for us, is information sharing. That's what we need to be able to identify where industry is and what we can go after and do. And so that's what success looks for me, I think, is that information, that exchange of information. And then you have the ability to come work with us and offer um, your technology, your solutions. Um, Ideally, we want to encourage companies that have not worked with the Army to come and work with us. And that's what the Army Applications Lab is here to do. We are here to help be the front door for you and to help shepherd you as you come in to this, this very process-driven organization and help you through that process. We want your technology, and we want to be able to apply it to the soldiers in these armored formations. Those soldiers will ultimately be the folks that raise their hand, the beneficiaries of your technology. And, and in reality, it will be the sons and daughters of, of those of us in this room who will have the opportunity to use that one day on the battlefield. Um, so yesterday, we had the opportunity to hear from General Simmering. Uh, he, he gave a, an overview on why we need armored formations. He talked a lot about the tank. Uh, he talked about the United States being in an interwar period, that now is the time that we need to work to modernize our formations, not when we're in a war. Uh, he highlighted that during World War I, the introduction of the machine gun really introduced what he called the no man's land, and that back then that that necessitated a need for a armored vehicle to help bridge that no man's land. The no man's land back then was measured in 10 to hundreds of meters. He said that today that is now measured in tens of kilometers with the advent of cheap, affordable precision munitions available to our adversaries. General Simmering highlighted the role of the tank. He, talks, he talked that it needed to be mobile, it needed to offer protection, and that it needed to offer firepower necessary to destroy the enemy. Those three things, mobility, protection, and firepower, are the, 
the basic fundamental needs of what the armored formation has. That's what we require. And then General Simmering offered at the end what our armored formations need, that they need to have platforms with open architectures, they need to weigh less, they need to have integrated protection, and they need to be more sustainable. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Nick Morin, he offered us a historical perspective on how our armored formations developed over time. He highlighted that we don't need new technology by itself, but rather we need technology with doctrine to be able to operate and fight effectively. He showed us some of our technological failures and what we might learn from them as we move towards modernizing our organizations. And he highlighted that many of our past challenges in the armored formations continue to be our future challenges, that we will continue to have to operate in an area where we need to consider the air domain. We need to be able to operate in chemical environments. We, we have to deal with complex obstacles, with minefields. We have to be able to, to sustain our organizations, and we have to be able to, to cross wet and dry gaps with our armored formations. And then we had a panel on ethical decision-making. Dr. Riddick highlighted the recent change to DOD Directive 3000.09, Autonomy and Weapon Systems. Amber Walker talked about the fact that we don't do autonomy for autonomy's sake, but it is a tool to help us to be more efficient. Matt Dooley emphasized the evolution of what the Army has asked about its robotics over the last few years, that it has gone from uh, we want positive control at all times to we're beginning to be more comfortable with autonomous systems. And then Michael Rose rightfully underscored that we're not quite there yet on where we need to be on autonomy, but we're heading in the right direction. So I look forward to more discussion today. Um, if General Simmering, as the Armor School Commandant, is the one that operates in the today with a foot and eye to the future, it's, it's the individual that looks to the future but operates in today is who I'd like to introduce. The director of the Next Gen Combat Vehicle Cross-Functional Team, Brigadier General Norman. General Norman is a career armor officer. He served in every formation from the platoon to the core level. He's commanded armored formations at the company, the battalion, and the brigade level. He served as the deputy commanding general for support for the 1st Infantry Division, and while deployed to Poland, he was the commanding general forward of 1st ID. He has experience training armored formations in the United States. He served in uh, units in Korea, in Iraq, and in Egypt. And in addition to his time in tactical units, General Norman has experience in assignments related to modernizing the Army. He's worked in the Pentagon, focused on the maneuver, the soldier, and the robotics portfolios, which is where I first had the opportunity to work with him. Uh, he came here to Austin, and he worked in Army Futures Command Headquarters, where I had the chance to work for him. And he is currently the director of the Next Gen Combat Vehicle Fighting or Cross-Functional Team. It, sorry, it warms my heart to see you. Um, I've often thought, what would General Norman do in this case? And take that as, a, as counsel that he, if he's not there, to, to help guide me. Sure, thank you. Thanks, and welcome, General Norman, everyone. Oh, really appreciate it. Well, good, good morning, everyone. Um, it is awesome to be back here in Austin. Um, this is a city that's close to my heart. But more importantly, it's great to be in an environment uh, where as professionals, we're sharing ideas and delivering on the the tall order that Clay laid out for us a, a minute ago. The exchange of information, the exchange of ideas, uh, the disciplined definition of problem sets that we're working on, um, that's really valuable. So thank you to AAL and the Vertex team and, uh, and uh, for bringing me uh, here and bringing uh, the members of Next Gen Combat Vehicles cross-functional team into this conversation. I think it's absolutely um, a time well spent and I hope you're having the, the same experience. So um, I, I'm going to go through just a few slides, but the, um, the slides are pretty thin on, uh, on details, but I'll explain more as we go um, what, what some of the, the bullets mean. So if we go to the first chart, I want to just give you a quick highlight of what the cross-functional team is, uh, what we do, um, and differentiate it a little bit from uh, what say the, the armor commandant does or what a C did does. So um, as was mentioned, we're up in Warren, Michigan at Detroit Arsenal, co-located with the program executive offices uh, for ground combat systems, uh, combat support and service support, uh, and co-located with the ground vehicle system center and army contracting command. So there's sort of a, 
a critical mass of, um, of Army equities at Detroit Arsenal. Uh, and so we are, in some ways, the, the operational extension of Fort Moore that's uh, up at, at Detroit Arsenal to, um, to communicate requirements, uh, run experiments, uh, and be the, the voice of the soldier. Uh, so our cross-functional team consists of about 30 uh, experts, um, and as the name implies, across various functions, whether it be tests, uh, logistics and sustainment, um, operational research, uh, and uh, the team includes about uh, 12 green suitors, uh, senior non-commissioned officers, master gunners, uh, and then field grade officers who have uh, just come out of uh, operational um, assignments, uh, like Greg Jelly, uh, who came down with me, who uh, just left 3rd Brigade, 4th ID, uh, where he had spent uh, the, the previous nine months uh, forward on uh, you know, NATO's eastern flank in uh, Bulgaria. And so they bring a great uh, operational perspective and recent experience uh, that allows us to uh, execute our tasks. And the four tasks that we really focus on are first and foremost to, to gather and provide operational feedback to, the, uh, to developers, engineers, and folks that are working in uh, the modernization space. Provide soldier feedback and create environments for soldiers to provide feedback on uh, efforts that are going on. Do that through experimentation. Uh, we uh, set the experimental objectives and then help design the experiments to uh, provide that, that soldier feedback and, and provide an analytic underpinning for the efforts that we want the Army to pursue. Uh, and then more, most importantly, in blue, there you can see that our, our principal responsibility is to generate requirements, to generate requirements that are based on soldier input and soldier feedback uh, analysis uh, and experimentation. So five, ten years from now, uh, we can trace back uh, a capability to a requirement that's underpinned by analysis, uh, soldier feedback, uh, and can stand the test of time. So the ways we do that are uh, represented by the pictures around the, the perimeter there. Uh, so there are sort of four-ish uh, things that we do. So. Uh, we host and facilitate soldier innovation workshops uh, where uh, members uh, from different operational units, uh, different communities within the Army come together uh, and share their ideas with uh, designers and concept uh, developers uh, that work in this space. So the soldier innovation workshops are uh, really important events. That transitions then to become uh, virtual prototyping and virtual experiments. Uh, where we put soldiers uh, in either a constructive environment where they're working on, on laptops that are connected to run scenarios or physically place them in crew station mock-ups and then immerse them in, in a simulation uh, so they can provide feedback on what works, uh, what doesn't work, and ways that we can do things differently. And then we go out to the field uh, and put uh, equipment and formations through their paces, and we do that uh, through soldier touch points, uh, that are supported by uh, Forces Command units, uh, and we do soldier operational experiments, SOEs. And Mike Rose mentioned uh, the, the ones that uh, we've done recently up here at uh, Fort Cavazos uh, with robotic combat vehicles. Uh, and in the case of SOE2, that uh, was about a two-month uh, event from tip to tail, but five weeks of uh, deep experimentation with soldiers from 17 Cav. Really a, a great uh, event. Learned a lot about uh, human-machine integration uh, and the robotics requirements for an uh, armored brigade combat team and heavy units. And then lastly, um, we are deeply involved in uh, uh, the limited user tests uh, and initial operational tests and evaluations. So our responsibilities as a cross-functional team really start with a concept or when somebody gets a twinkle in their eyes and then uh, runs through the first unit equipped or a decision for full rate production and then we hand uh, the responsibility over to a seated. So if we go to the next chart, I'll give you an example. These are the, the four principal things that the Army's senior leaders have assigned for the next generation combat vehicles, plural, cross-functional team to work on. So the XM-30 combat vehicle, the replacement for the Bradley, the Abrams transformation, M1E3, and those are a couple uh, artist renderings of uh, what those uh, systems could look like, both on XM-30 and the Abrams transformation. 
M10 Booker light tank, um, and then uh, robotic combat vehicles and human machine integration uh, writ large. The, the robots that you see in front of the, the AMP V there are just a, a representation, again, an artist representation of a, a possible solution that those um, are, are going through a open competition right now with four vendors competing. So I don't want to presuppose the outcome of that competition with a picture, uh, but that is a, an example of an artist rendering. But as you see, there's a, the armored multi-purpose vehicle uh, up there. In this case, serving as the control vehicle uh, for robotic combat vehicles. AMP-V used to fall under the next-gen combat vehicles cross-functional team. Um, and as that went into full rate production and has completed its first unit equipped with 1st Brigade, uh, Brigade 3rd ID down at Fort Stewart, we've now transitioned that over to the maneuver C did at Fort Moore. Uh, and they're doing great things to continue to, to advocate for that capability and to continue to look at where it needs to go in the future and um, additional opportunities. So now we're focused on these four things. And so um, some might see that as being somewhat uh, restrictive in that there are only four things we're working on. But I'll, what, what I'll tell you is this is where the money is. And given uh, Clay's uh, laydown of, of my recent past, um, I'll tell you that, that that's worth knowing. If you're an industry partner, if you're a non-traditional, uh, if you're a, an innovator and a problem solver, you, you probably need to know where the Army's investing. Um, and uh, it's against these four uh, broad sets of capabilities that are, that are listed up here. We're doing other things as well, uh, but there's plenty of space for innovation uh, aligned against these activities. And so the program executive offices, in this case, all of those fall under ground combat systems, PEO, GCS, uh, and uh, General Dean's uh, multiple PMs and uh, product managers, some of whom are in the room here, like Steve Herrick. Steve, raise your hand, please. Uh, you know, he's, he's Mr. RCV along with his wingman, Greg. Greg, raise your hand. So anything uh, related to RCV, uh, if, you, if, you don't have a if you haven't had a chance to talk to them, uh, please do over the course of your time here, because uh, uh, that they're the folks who have been really empowered to execute these programs, and we're excited about the progress we're making. So I want to talk about, um, on the next chart, I want to talk about some mounted formation technology um, challenges and truisms. And so what Mike Simmering laid out yesterday was really helpful to understand kind of how we got where we are and where we think we might need to go uh, in the future for the tank specifically, but uh, mounted formations um, more, uh, more globally. But I want to talk about some challenges that we focus and things that I think uh, are helpful for you to be aware of as you uh, assist um, us working to solve problems. So first off, um, I'll, I'll mention that any new material solution has to enhance the formation's effectiveness. So um, it, it might seem obvious, but adding technology or adding new capability, adding uh, a new uh, capability in air quotes that doesn't really enhance the formation's effectiveness is not helpful and likely won't be resourced. Uh, and, and so we're going to measure not the effectiveness of that particular technology. We're going to measure formation performance, formation effectiveness. So if we add a particular capability that meets its measures of performance, but overall the formation is less effective, we're not going to pursue it. So a simple example, and for some of you who are down at the Maneuver Center, you might have heard this during uh, the, the Maneuver Conference recently, uh, when a really smart engineer uh, who does uh, robotics for use on the lunar surface pointed out that robots are supposed to help humans. The whole point is to reduce the, the demand on the human by uh, adding robotics or adding a robotic capability. So if it takes more work by the human to make the robot do its job, then that's counterproductive. And it might seem intuitive, but as we start introducing these capabilities, we have to be honest with ourselves about whether they are actually adding a burden or reducing a burden. And we're going to go with those capabilities that reduce burden, vice add the burden. So um, our formation effectiveness is going to be largely defined or scoped 
by uh, what we can protect and where we can protect and what and where we can sustain. So exquisite capabilities that we can't protect uh, or exquisite capabilities that we can't sustain are actually going to limit our formation effectiveness. So what and where we can protect and what and where we can sustain uh, really uh, define our formation effectiveness or perhaps uh, limit our formation effectiveness. So we're going to be really uh, keyed on, on that challenge to make sure that we don't end up signing up uh, for, for capabilities um, that we can't protect uh, or that drive up our sustainment demands. So tied to that is uh, a capability that we can't afford or that we can't generate capacity, um, either by not having enough numbers of that particular capability or not having deep enough magazine depth, you know, too few rounds, too few engagements, um, or a capability that we can't sustain is ultimately unhelpful for a formation. So we're going to steer away from, from those things as well. The flip side, of course, is true. Those things that add capability um, and we can generate capacity uh, are absolutely essential. And those things that reduce sustainment burden are, are uh, what we're going after. And then one of the truisms that sometimes we're able to follow and sometimes we challenge, are challenged with is we are uh, within our cross-functional team, within the program executive office uh, for ground combat systems, GVSC, uh, all of our teammates, we're really focused on avoiding uh, getting locked in to solutions um, or dated technology and previously used fixed approaches. We're trying to uh, work towards open approaches, um, new technology or uh, emerging technology, um, and I think that that's going to pay us dividends uh, overall. So the seven things that we value are listed up there as well, and I'll expand on those a little bit. So first off, and probably most importantly, particularly for all of uh, our master gunners, non-commissioned officers, and soldiers in, in the room, is we need systems that work. So exquisite systems that don't work are interesting but not compelling, and we don't need to put those uh, in our formations and in the hands of soldiers. So first of all, reliability and ruggedness uh, are absolutely essential. And we're talking about ground combat uh, vehicles here. So I uh, recently heard a Marine uh, explain uh, the best way to get two bowling balls is to hand one to a Marine. The same is true for ground combat soldiers, whether they're infantry soldiers, cavalrymen or, or tankers. The best way to get two of any item is to hand that tanker one of them because they're bound and determined to break it into two uh, one way or another. So we need systems that are rugged, uh, but we need those systems that are reliable that can work under the, the demands of the, the crucible of ground combat. Modular open systems architecture. You've heard that uh, several times throughout this uh, event and uh, you've heard them uh, at other events as well. The MOSA architecture that, that we're pursuing uh, for XM30 as, the, as sort of the lead sled dog in that effort, but will be uh, applied likely to the Abrams transformation and uh, eventually to RCV, is GCIA, the Ground Combat Systems Common Infrastructure Architecture. That is a mouthful, uh, maybe by design, maybe not, but GCIA is the MOSA uh, that we're using in the, the ground combat vehicle space. Uh, and so if it's not something that you're familiar with, uh, please uh, uh, leverage the opportunities that you may have to get with uh, Dr. Mackham up at, uh, uh, at Detroit Arsenal and Warren and, and uh, any of the teammates from XM30 that are really leading the charge on GCIA. Um, that last one on the, the left side there, conformal designs. What am I talking about there? You know, we're not trying to design ground combat vehicles that are going to break the sound barrier. But what we are trying to do, uh, and what we will do with the transformation of Abrams, with XM30, uh, is design systems that have a reduced visual signature, that don't look like uh, some Lego creation that our kids did just by adding blocks on all over the place uh, to get new capabilities on there. Integrated solutions versus appended solutions. Conformal uh, systems that provide a very uh, reduced visual uh, and potentially uh, visual signature and, and, uh, and other uh, 
uh, observation. So we're, we're seeking to get away from all of the appended solutions and things that are hanging off that get caught in the trees. So conformal designs is something that we're going to prioritize going forward. And then those uh, four on the right uh, jump out and you, you kind of get the drumbeat with those. So simplicity uh, is going to be essential. We're going to reduce the number of crew members that are on board a vehicle. In the case of XM30, we're going from three crew members, a gunner, a Bradley commander, and a driver, down to two crew members. And the roles for those crew members are going to be more generic. We're probably going to have someone who's dedicated to being the, the driver and the vehicle commander, and then one who's principally the gunner and payload operator. We've gone through a number of experiments with soldiers in those vehicles or mock-ups of those vehicles to work through. In order to, to make that work, the systems need to be simpler than the systems are right now. Reliability, absolutely essential. Um, again, we're going to have reduced crew members. We're going to have uh, more demanding operational environments. So the reliability of these systems is going to be uh, critical moving forward. And tied to that is going to be their maintainability with fewer people, with longer duration uh, operations. Being able to maintain our, our systems will be something that we measure uh, rigorously. Uh, and I think that some of the solutions that you all are working on will really aid us uh, in improving our, our maintenance capabilities. Some of that has to do with predictive and prognostic uh, maintenance solutions. Systems that can identify when something is likely uh, failing or about to fail, that's, that's really helpful. Um, and so a lot of the PPMX, the predictive and prognostic maintenance uh, solutions are, are things that we're exploring. And then sustainment, reducing our sustainment burden. So transitioning from uh, traditional propulsion systems, uh, diesel or multi-fuel engines, and turbine engines, gas turbine engines, to hybrid electric powertrains. Uh, likely something that you're going to see us pursue, pursue in the future. Uh, XM30, we anticipate that both of those designs are going to include uh, hybrid electric powertrains, uh, not only to reduce the fuel demands on the formation, but also because of the operational benefits that we're going to have with silent mobility, additional long duration silent watch, all of that is going to be possible with the uh, desired outcome too of uh, reduced uh, sustainment burden. So those are some of the things that we value, seven things that we value phrased in a way that might be a little bit different than what you've uh, heard before. So the challenges and truisms and then the, the things that we're valuing moving forward. So if we go to the, the last chart that I've got, um, I'm going to lay out what are the high level objectives, what are our formation objectives that we're trying to achieve. Some of these objectives can be uh, applied directly uh, against platforms themselves, but some of them uh, really can't be measured only at the platform level, and we need to take a formation approach to uh, addressing these. So first off, uh, we kind of group these into the shoot, move, communicate, uh, sustain, and survive. So those are kind of the, the bins, uh, and that's not new. Certainly, shoot, move, communicate has been uh, a, a way of uh, organizing our thoughts for, for generations. But what we're looking to do specifically um, is, first off, to increase the human performance of our crew members. And we do that by optimizing the use of uh, robotics and automation, uh, and at times, uh, adding AI capabilities uh, to the functions of the system. But what we're trying to do is make the humans more effective on those systems by offloading tasks, by offloading the burden uh, from the humans uh, onto uh, the platform itself. AI is helpful, machine learning can help, automation for tasks that previously required a lot of human intervention. Uh, those are things that we're trying to do in order to increase the performance of the humans uh, on that platform, in that formation, leading those formations. Goes without saying that we seek to increase lethality, but it's not necessarily by just adding uh, more weapon systems to a particular platform, increasing their caliber or their size, uh, or adding um, you know, a, additional loitering munitions or uh, the like. Increasing lethality uh, needs to be uh, addressed at a formation level. 
So although a particular tank or a, particularly com a particular combat vehicle's uh, weapons load or round count might remain the same, there are ways that we can increase the formation's lethality uh, by uh, addressing um, other additions or adding capabilities to things that might not uh, exist currently. So again, we're not going to be measuring platform versus platform uh, to assess the lethality, uh, whether it's gone up or gone down. We're going to look at that from an overall formation approach. We have to do that because the other thing we're trying, another thing that we're trying to do is decrease the formation's weight and size. And the reason for that is uh, kind of manifold, but the first one is we're trying to improve mobility of our formations. Mobility in three general uh, categories. First is strategic mobility. Strategic mobility is largely uh, scoped by the size of your vehicles. It's less about the weight of your vehicles. So getting strategic mobility, getting from uh, a home station, post camp or station, to a port, and then onward move uh, to uh, uh, a forward location somewhere. The, the size of our vehicles for sea load makes more of a difference than their weight. Uh, weight is important in terms of the rail cars, the bridges that they have to cross to get to a railhead potentially, but size is really the, the limiting factor there. The second category is operational mobility. Getting from the port, name the, the country or theater that you want to be in, but getting from the port forward to a staging area, uh, a forward operating site, uh, or an assembly area. So the operational mobility. That's really defined or scoped by the size of the vehicles and the weight of the vehicle. Size of the vehicle, because we need to get through bridges, or I'm sorry, get through tunnels, uh, and um, the weight is really uh, scopes what rail cars we can use, what heavy equipment transport trailers we can use, uh, what bridges we can cross. So the operational mobility, how we get from the port to the uh, forward operating site or the assembly area uh, really demands a, a reduction in weight and size. And then lastly, and perhaps closest to, to a lot of our hearts, is the tactical mobility that we're seeking to improve by decreasing weight. And that's principally a, a weight reduction uh, issue uh, that we're seeking there. Allows us to cross more bridges, uh, to use more um, uh, gap crossing systems that already exist, uh, other HETs that uh, we might not be able to use with our heaviest systems. All of those things are, are enabled by a lower weight. And then certainly our cross-country mobility is much improved uh, with vehicles that that weigh less than 80 tons. Uh, but tied to that too, um, I'm going to jump down uh, one, is minimizing the sustainment burden on the formation. Um, we anticipate that lighter vehicles and smaller vehicles will have a, a lower sustainment burden. That's not going to happen by accident or by coincidence, so that's one of the design characteristics that uh, we're, we're baking in and we're evaluating rigorously. Uh, so minimizing the sustainment burden on the formation is essential. We can do that by reducing the number of combat vehicles in the formation. Um, that's a way to crack that nut, but that's not necessarily the only approach we want to take. We want to uh, have uh, the Army formations consist of vehicles that require less fuel, that have the ability to run longer uh, on the, the same amount of fuel that we currently have. You know. If current armored formations in the offense have to refuel two uh, or sometimes three times a day, uh, we seek uh, material solutions, combat vehicles and formations that only require uh, one refuel per day. That probably will reduce the number of fuel helmets. It will reduce uh, the number of resupply um, formations that need to come up to the combat formations for refuel improves our tempo, puts fewer soldiers at risk. You can see all the knock-on effects uh, by reducing the sustainment burden. That's uh, achieved by different power plants, and it's achieved by lighter vehicles uh, that require less fuel. Jumping back up one. So we're seeking to improve communications uh, in reducing our network demand. Um, the panel yesterday 
um, you know, Dr. Walker, Matt, and Mike uh, were all highlighting sort of the, the paradox um, that, that we're facing with uh, our desire for robotics um, and human machine integration, uh, where um, we want to have, uh, there's a demand for full motion video for 4K uh, coming in from every robotic system that's, that's out there. But that puts a huge demand on our, our networks, likely unachievable. But because, um, and the, the reason that people want that, that commanders and leaders want that 4K video, want that high fidelity uh, image to come in, is because they're having to make decisions based on the information uh, that those robots uh, are generating, based on what they're seeing in their environment. Once we solve the challenges of autonomy, uh, there will be a lower demand for uh, as robust a network. But the paradox is that, you know, we're not quite there yet. Uh, and so as a result of having autonomy that's still developing, we're putting a larger demand on our networks. And so until we can tip that balance and get our autonomy um, matured to the point where it reduces our network demand, uh, we're going to have to temper our expectations for how many robots are forward and what we're asking them to do. And we're gonna have to temper uh, or adjust our expectations for uh, the amount of information and the type of information commanders and leaders are using uh, to make decisions. But certainly um, there are opportunities for us to improve communications uh, and then ways that we need to go about decreasing the network demands instead of just adding uh, bandwidth uh, and spectrum uh, requirements onto our, our network buddies. And then lastly, uh, sort of in the, the survive uh, category, increasing protection without incurring a weight burden um, is, is absolutely essential. Um, so right now we're not tracking uh, any material breakthroughs. Um, unobtainium still remains unobtainable at this point. Um, we're not seeing um, new uh, alloys that are going to be um, significant game changers in the next couple of years. We are encouraged by some of the material science um, developments that are happening out there. Um, so we're going to have to take a different approach. We can't uh, bank on the promise of a new steel or a new, you know, fill in the blank alloy in the immediate future. So we're going to have to take a different, more innovative approach to designing our vehicles by having uh, integrated active protection. Um, adjusting our passive protection uh, to, to uh, be optimized given what the active protection systems can do and get that recipe right in order to be uh, effective, to have the, the right components of the, the vehicle protected, particularly the crew compartment, uh, without adding a weight burden. So again, we're seeking you know ballpark um, uh, reduction of 10 to 15 percent uh, for our, um, for the main battle tank is the, the goal that we're seeking. The actual requirement is dialed in much more specifically than that, and uh, so that'll become clear as that information becomes public. But in the case of uh, the XM30, um, I'll, I'll point out in full disclosure that that vehicle is going to weigh more than a Bradley, and that was a conscious design decision, but the increased protection that we get from that uh, was was worth that trade. So we're excited about that capability, if, even if it is a little larger and a little heavier than the, the current Bradley. So those are the uh, the main things that, that I wanted to cover in terms of formation uh, level uh, improvements that we're seeking uh, through those four efforts, the XM30, the M10 Booker light tank, uh, the Abrams transformation effort, and then the human machine integration RCV efforts for the Armored Brigade Combat Team. So let me pause there um, and uh, close with uh, uh, where I finished, and that is, uh, or close with where I started uh, by pointing out that this is a really exciting time uh, in this space. There is a lot of energy and activity going on um, that's going to result in, I believe, transformation of our mounted formations. The uh, introduction of robotic combat vehicles that bring real capabilities to our formations is really exciting, and it provides us an opportunity to fight differently. The transformation of the Abrams main battle tank 
uh, is going to give uh, our commanders and formations opportunities to fight in ways that we haven't been able to fight uh, with, with that platform. XM30 is going to bring new levels of lethality and protection uh, to our mechanized formations and allow our, our infantry soldiers to have uh, a capability uh, that uh, we owe them and that uh, they'll be able to bring to the next level. Um, and the M10 Booker light tank combat vehicle that's going into the IBCTs and our light formations is going to give them the ability to uh, remain on their front foot on the offense, taking the fight to the enemy uh, with a capability that we haven't seen uh, in decades. So really fired up about the, the future. I hope that some of the work that you're doing in your various spaces can find their way into our formations that are equipped uh, with these vehicles. And I look forward to taking any questions you may have. Are you talking how much are you going to do for your material support and what's that ramp up going to look like? Okay. The question had to do with prepo, prepositioning. Uh, what are we thinking about or doing with that? Um, so that's a, a, a valid point and a, a valid consideration. Um, and um, none of the, the work that we're doing presupposes uh, whether this equipment will be prepositioned, forward positioned. Uh, or stationed uh, in CONUS and then moved uh, to forward locations. Um, our preference uh, as, um, as operators and, and folks in formations would probably be to be forward stationed. That would be ideal, uh, but that's not likely going to be the case for all of these capabilities. So the, the next best thing might be to have pre-positioned equipment, uh, but that also comes with a significant cost. Uh, political agreements, um, and an investment that's uh, going to be, um, you know, tailored uh, to what, what can be affordable and what's politically acceptable. So the vast majority of the, this equipment in these formations are going to be CONUS-based and then have to be moved forward uh, prior to crisis or in time of crisis. And so I'll, I'll go on a quick tangent uh, with that, just based on um, my experience as the um, one ID forward commander. Um, I think it's absolutely essential that as we look at um, our capabilities, um, we don't assume that peacetime restrictions uh, for movement and for transportation are going to magically be waived uh, in a time of crisis. Um, as we were flowing in, um, multiple armored brigade combat teams uh, as the Russians were about to invade Ukraine uh, in late January and early February. Um, the Europeans were not inclined in the least bit to waive their ADR requirements. They weren't inclined in the least bit uh, to let us smash their tunnels as we were uh, trying to move things around on rail cars. Um, and they weren't inclined to let us go overweight on all their roads and wreck their autobahns. So we need to um, go in very clear-eyed um, with the requirements in peacetime for movement, deployment, mobility are likely going to be the demands uh, that are going to um, face our units as we're in a time of crisis potentially moving to conflict. And that's on the mobility side. On the training side, I think we also need to be clear-eyed uh, about robotics in particular and in, in lethal systems to make sure that those can be used um, in training and in training environments on ranges um, and in events in peacetime. Otherwise, we likely won't have uh, the um, opportunity to gain proficiency for those in crisis or in conflict. Uh, so, you know, there are a whole range of, of implications for that. But I think if we go in clear-eyed, we'll make the right design and technology decisions. Follow-up to that is the upgrade cycle in today's world is two to six months. So what are you guys looking at for an upgrade cycle or a refurbishment cycle on all the material that you might have in place and might or might not have in place that you can get to? 
Yeah, so the, the way we're tackling that is through the modular open systems architecture approach. So MOSA uh, is the path to speed up the upgrade cycle uh, because in many respects, uh, the new capabilities that we're going to have are going to be more software defined than they are hardware defined. And so for XM30, for Abrams uh, transformation, M1E3, M1A3, uh, for RCVs, the modular open systems architecture, in our case GCIA, uh, is going to enable us to speed up uh, that upgrade cycle uh, in a way that we haven't been able to do before. And we're really excited about that opportunity. It doesn't address what we do with legacy fleets. Uh, I acknowledge that. Um, that's a little bit beyond my, uh, my wheelhouse right now, um, but I'm definitely focused on the MOSA approach for the, the new systems that we're working on. Good. Matt. for optionally maintained. Yeah, the question was uh, previous um, communications from the Army uh, included three classes of robotic combat vehicles, a light, a medium, and a heavy. Um, and uh, is there any linkage with M1E3 to what was previously described as RCV heavy or an optionally manned tank? That was, uh, I think, uh, for those who were in the back. Uh, so, um, we are um, resource informed as we go forward uh, in the robotic combat vehicle uh, endeavors in the human machine integrated formation endeavors. Uh, and what we believe that we can afford as taxpayers to provide the Army is funding for one robotic combat vehicle uh, effort for the ABCTs. And um, we're gonna call it RCV Schmedium. It was, uh, it was light, and medium combined to one, um, and it's the Schmedium. But it is the RCV light program uh, that Steve Herrick and Greg are doing great things with. So the Schmedium, AKA RCV light, is the robot that's uh, in the robotic platform that's gonna make up the bulk of the RCVs, the ground robotic combat vehicles in our ABCTs. Um, it brings the, the best and most achievable of the RCV medium uh, capabilities onto a platform that, was a little, that is a little bigger than the original lights were intended to be, hence the, the Schmedium. Heavy, the purpose for heavy, um, or what was uh, conceived as an optionally manned tank uh, as we were uh, beginning experimentation, was principally to be a decisive lethality platform, uh, a platform that could be unmanned, uh, likely not optionally manned, but, but unmanned. Uh, they could put decisive direct fire lethality um, in places and in environments um, where a main battle tank currently does that. That demands um, either a really, really robust network, if those are going to be remote controlled vehicles, teleoperated. Um, uh, a stable and anti-fragile network that currently doesn't exist, uh, or it demands autonomy uh, that isn't achievable today or in the next year or so. So as a result, we've put our ambitions for optionally manned tank RCV heavy um, on, a, on a longer time frame, a longer timeline, um, and that's not something that we're pursuing immediately. So M1E3, Abrams Transformation, is not intended uh, to produce uh, a um, unmanned tank, despite what uh, might be out on, on X or on a, a Chinese uh, social media feed uh, from speculation, uh, that's not the, the case. Um, um, Abrams transformation will be an, an optimally manned uh, Abrams, uh, minimally manned. It may have a different crew configuration than we currently have, but it won't be uh, a robotic Abrams. Uh, we are not pursuing the RCV medium in an RCV heavy at this time, but we are going for Schmedium because it sounds cool. Thanks, Arnold. Uh, 
Good to see you again. Uh, quick question about the increased lethality. Uh, specifically, you just mentioned decisive direct fire engagement. Uh, is there any con up in regards to beyond line of sight uh, and tethered sensors in order to see over a crest? Yeah, thanks, Jim. So great question. And um, the short answer is yes. Just as uh, General Simmering was defining the, the no man's land as having expanded from being a few hundred meters based on the, the range of machine guns to now being um, you know, multiple kilometers or tens of kilometers based on uh, loitering munitions, precision uh, guided munitions, sort of demands a beyond line of sight uh, capability. So in conjunction with Fort Moore, um, the Maneuver Battle Lab, um, and the Army Capability Manager for ABCT, ACMA, -A, um, we're revisiting the operational mode summary and mission profile for uh, the different platforms and formations that are in an armored brigade combat team. What experimentation is showing us is that um, armored formations that have um, decisive lethality, direct fire capabilities um, out to five or 10 kilometers, uh, direct line of sight, um, better than their adversary, are highly effective. But those same formations that have the ability to shape uh, with beyond line of sight, um, sensing and um, lethality are much more effective than those that don't. So we're better off uh, creating an armored formation that has the ability to sense beyond line of sight, strike beyond line of sight, but retain its direct fire uh, line of sight capabilities uh, better than the adversary. That's a, a better formation than the alternative that's only good line of sight. Of course, there's a trade-off there. There's a trade-off because uh, as we add beyond line of sight or non-line of sight capabilities, uh, we're either adding weight we're adding complexity, <clears throat> or we're reducing the number of line of sight uh, munitions and capabilities that we might be able to have on board the platform, which really cries then or calls for a formation-based approach to this, uh, which means that what we don't want to create is a 100-ton tank that has loitering munitions beyond line of sight, extended line of sight, um, and you know dual-barrel 130-millimeter uh, direct fire on it. You know, it looks good on a <clears throat> in a CAD diagram, maybe, um, but it's not going to look good for the uh, mobility warrant who has to get that thing out of uh, Fort Cavazos and uh, forward to some location in the Indo-PACOM region. So we're having to take a, a formation approach to solve the problem that you described. So maybe it involves having tanks that are likely going to be pretty far forward on the battlefield, launching UAS deploying tethered UASs so they can see line of sight, so they can see beyond IV lines that were previously obscuring them, and then having off-board uh, beyond line of sight shooters, whether that's a different tank or whether it's a different uh, robotic combat vehicle, uh, or maybe it's an XM-30 uh, that's receiving that target uh, and then engaging it. So we think that it, we are uh, needing a formation-based approach uh, to solve that problem. It won't be exclusively a platform-specific uh, approach, but a, a great point, something we're definitely taking a hard look at. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Andy. So you, you talk about cooperative engagement just now and formation approach to uh, lethality. Can you uh, give us your thoughts on uh, the same concept with the protection? How yeah. Does, what does cooperative protection look like? It's a great question. So. Um, there is a, uh, a paradox associated with cooperative protection, too. Uh, but but um, top-level goal would be to have um, capabilities that are distributed, um, I should say disparate capabilities that are distributed uh, across the formation that are complementary, that allow us to be protected against all the forms of contact without having to have all of those systems on every vehicle turned on all the time. So that's the goal. The goal would be to spread out. So you might have uh, a robotic combat vehicle that has a counter UAS system that's able to put the proverbial bubble over the formation. You might have uh, other vehicles that have active protection systems that protect not only themselves, but also their wingmen. 
because they're sensing threats to, to multiple vehicles and engaging to destroy those incoming ATGMs. And I could go through the different forms of contact, but you get the drift. That's the goal. Uh, distributed protection on, on different platforms that provide cooperative protection. Um, the current challenge associated with that, though, is it, it demands or results in two things. One, uh, it results in us having to um, light up the EM spectrum by uh, uh, turning on radars that have much uh, farther ranges uh, or additional capabilities than the close-in radars with very low power that would be needed to protect uh, an individual vehicle. So we might end up exposing the formation uh, in an attempt to protect the formation. And the other thing that we could inadvertently do is cause that formation to have to bunch up uh, to really uh, compress uh, or concentrate, which is exactly uh, what the enemy would like us to do and is the opposite of what we want to do, which is disperse to survive and concentrate effects as needed and then disperse and to do those pulsed operations. It's probably the wrong use for the term, uh, but that's generally the way we see, whether it's Nagorno-Karabakh uh, or in Ukraine or other places, uh, to, to survive uh, and to avoid mass indirect fires, dispersion is key. So we need to make sure that through cooperative protection, we don't have the unintended consequence of causing our forces to have to concentrate. But that's absolutely what we're after. We think that every vehicle protecting itself against all uh, forms of contact uh, is unaffordable from a weight and cost standpoint, and it also adds cognitive burden or compute burden on that vehicle uh, that, that isn't going to be achievable. But uh, um, that's absolutely something that we're studying and uh, would love uh, assistance in that space from smart problem solvers like y'all. So again, John, thank you. Uh, great uh, event here, and thank you. Uh, everybody for being part of it and look forward to the conversations. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you for, for providing us some of those uh, critical insights into what Next Generation Combat Vehicle Team is, is doing and, and kind of how you're thinking about the, the future of those capabilities. Uh, we've got our first panel of the morning coming up and then we'll, we'll take a, a break after that. I couldn't think of a better segue, honestly, uh, into the first panel, which is MOSA, MOSA, MOSA opportunities and, and challenges. Um, brief introduction to our, our moderator for, for this morning's panel, Mr. John uh, Stow. Um, John is the, the chief solutions architect for JHNA, a defense consulting company that provides subject matter experts as the, quote, warfighter to engineer interface on complex systems. He is the, the lead subject matter expert um, for architecture and enterprise transformation, uh, both for Army Aviation, providing modular open systems architecture support to, to that PEO, Future Vertical Lift, and a platform that's near and dear to my heart as a, a former aviator, the H-60 Blackhawk. So, John, the floor is yours. All right, great. Thank you, sir. And uh, thanks for the introduction. So I, I think I'll start off by uh, just asking the panel to come up, and we'll, we'll just go ahead and introduce them uh, as we get, move along. I, I will ask for some grace. Um, I have a bit of a sensory impairment. Um, I suffer from something called the defense industrial complex. Um, it, it has severely damaged my sense of humor. So, um, so let's, let's go ahead and y'all help me with that, please, as we go. We want to make this a lively panel. Um, and, uh, and so a little bit of overview. So I'll actually leverage the UH-60 example for my start in modern open systems. Why am I here? Why, why should you care that I'd be moderating the panel? So we have a problem uh, coming back from, as a, as a software engineer, getting my first introduction to Army Aviation. Um, hey, you know, we're, we're, we're flying these uh, UH-60s and they still have steam gauges in them, just like my grandfather's F-150, right? And, and we want to put a glass cockpit. Can't be that hard, right? There's lots of glass cockpits out there. None of them are compatible. None of them have components that are interchangeable. And so what, what we did was to develop the uh, UH-60 Victor program, and I was the software IPT lead on that, and it was to take uh, a, a legacy uh, aircraft, a legacy Blackhawk, uh, and during its recapitalization, take the old analog cockpit out and put a digital cockpit in. 
um, and develop the set of open architecture technologies involved with that. So that was before the buzzword changed from open architecture to MOSA. Um, and have uh, we have worked through all of the the hitches to get to that uh, technology independence that allows you to change the change the software independent from the hardware because they move at different rates and to change the capabilities of the aircraft without changing the fundamental structures of the aircraft. And so how do we do that now instead of just for an individual platform? How do we do it for a system of systems? And this is important because we're moving with this concept of modular open systems approach away from individual exquisite platforms for overmatch to system of systems overmatch that requires hardware and software and algorithms to, to move at independent rates of change to create a continuous overmatch um, rather than a static overmatch. I, I put out a new F-35, great, catch me if you can. Well, if you, if you change at a rate that is faster than I can deploy new exquisite weapon systems, you win, right? So, so we have to think of overmatch in terms of a rate of change rather than overmatch as just a unique individual point of capability. So with that, we've got a, a panel assembled, and so I wanna, I wanna introduce these guys, and, and I will channel my inner millennial uh, and use my digital notes. Um, so we'll start off here uh, with uh, retired Lieutenant General Eric Wesley. Um, so there's a, has anyone seen the movie White Christmas? Um, oh, wow. <laughs> some of y'all need to get some nostalgia. Um, okay, so uh, there's this song, What Do You Do With a General? Um, I won't sing it. Uh, My kids well, sing that. Yeah, song. You, you know the song, <laughs> yeah. right? So, um, so I know L Lieutenant General Wesley or Eric has has the answer to this. You take a Lieutenant General out of the Army and put him in a small business. So now he has to understand how hard it is to run a small business. So, uh, so as a uh, uh, he understands both the Army perspective and the small business. He graduated from uh, the military academy with 34 years in the Army and finished his service as the Deputy Commander of Army Futures Command. Uh, and uh, one of his final projects was multi-domain operations, which we will pick on uh, greatly during our, our panel. Um, uh, and he served in a number of advisory roles uh, associated with JADC2, advanced nuclear power, electrification, uh, and, and he is now working for uh, Parasanti, a small business with a unique perspective on the role of MOSA in evolving operational paradigms. All right. We'll, uh, we'll let you add on to that, I think. Oh, I think you covered it. That's okay, good. Is, that, yeah. is that good enough? All right, so let's move on. And then we have, we go from uh, general and small business to how do you deal with the complexities uh, when lawyers need help, they call Susan Ebner. Um, Susan Ebner uh, is an expert in government contracts and she'll delve into the implications of MOSA for intellectual property and data rights and how do the legal frameworks need to adapt for this rapidly changing innovation landscape. You're moving from large, sophisticated prime contracts to small, unsophisticated, uh, highly technical, but not legally sophisticated or business sophisticated, uh, small entities that are bringing innovation. So how do we do this? So Susan is the past chair of the American Bar Association Public Contract Law Section. She's also uh, an ABA, uh, lots of acronym fellows, and she worked on the uh, uh, National Defense Industrial Association Cyber Legal Regulatory Policy Committee. Um, and I could continue on, but you should go check out Susan's dossier. She is amazing. Uh, and so uh, she, she was ultimately chair of the DC Bar Government Contracts and Litigation Section and a member of the US Federal Court of Appeals claims counsel. I can't get all the things that you've done, right? <laughs> so like I said, like if you've got a lawyer that's struggling, get her card and make sure your lawyer knows that she is the helpline for legal. Anything I wanna add to that, Susan? Go look at my resume. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, now we have uh, Hugh McFadden. Uh, so uh, Hugh uh, is representing L3 Harris. Uh, from an industry viewpoint, Hugh's gonna provide the insights on how MOSA impacts traditional platforms and OEMs. Um, and and uh, his innovative leadership at L3 uh, has been uh, leading the company's ground systems initiative uh, since he joined in 2020. His focus is on developing advanced weapons, modular open systems for ground vehicles and ensuring they're not only impactful, but also designed for continuous improvement and adaptability. Um, he's dedicated to accelerating technology into the fight uh, and emphasizes collaboration with end users, right? So Hugh's, uh, Hugh is guiding that part of his team and holds a Bachelor of Science and Master of Science from Florida Institute of Technology. Hugh, anything you want to add to that? All right, so we had a, we've had a pretty good set of 
of introductory discussions, but um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set up our conversation a little bit with, I, I came from a software background. I'm a, I'm a uh, SCADA systems and industrial control software guy moving into missile defense and then into Army aviation. So I really don't know anything about tanks, right? So I completely failed Nick's quiz yesterday on the tank, not a tank. Uh, so I caught him uh, for lunch, and we had a really interesting conversation regarding uh, what are the applications of modular open systems over the history of ground combat vehicles and ground fighting forces. And he gave me a really interesting example, and it was on the uh, uh, common remotely operated weapon system joystick controller. And so I thought this was an Army aviation problem where it's like you strap on a new piece of equipment to Army aviation and you can't integrate it to the rest of the systems. And he showed me a photograph where they have two joysticks, and all this extra equipment that has to be there for the, for the operator in this really confined space because you couldn't just use the common joystick that was already there. These systems don't integrate. So the turret has one joystick. You have to take your hand off that joystick, move to another joystick to, to manage the crow's system. And then we talked through a whole series of examples of how common logistics and parts in World War II. Um, oh, well, I can't get the unique part for your unique piece of equipment. Um, and instead of being able to say, well, I built one part that works on several pieces of equipment so I can redirect the supply chain and make sure that I don't have a logistics bottleneck. So anyway, the, the concept here is that modular open systems affects every aspect uh, of the warfighting environment, not just some small piece of software. Um, and so I'll start off the, the conversation uh, with, uh, with Eric here on this concept that we chatted about ahead of time. Um, moving from a kill chain to a kill web. I think you described it in a very uh, Christmas-like, you know, it's another ornament on the tree, oh, right? Yeah, I know. Oh, so, I'm sorry, I was, I'll let you, I'll let this back up. Let's rewind the tape. Um, but the idea that we have this, uh, this chain of effects that lead to a decision to, to perform one of our key functions, shoot, move, communicate, sense, recon, whatever the issue is, and we've got different sensors and different effectors. So how do you see modular open systems affecting this concept of moving from a kill chain to a kill web? Yeah, thanks. Um, first, it's great to be back here. I just um, sometimes it's good to look back in time and, and take inventory. The first time I walked on the stage was Summer of 2018, I was one of the first five boots on the ground from Army Futures Command, and now you fast forward, and we're doing these Vertex events multiple times a year, so AFC, AAL doing a great job, and I think this has been good for the Army. Um, I think many of you understand the idea of a, a kill web relative to a kill chain. Some might not, but, if you, but it's important to understand it because we are, we are betwixt between with legacy systems relative to sustainable systems and then future systems. Originally, we used to build combat uh, systems based on a kill chain. That is, you had a proprietary sensor that aligned very naturally with a proprietary weapon system. And we were very good, if you go back to Gulf War I and even Gulf War II, about aligning these sensors with unique shooters, and they're very effective. Um, the problem is that it, that system is very brittle. If you think about a 72-hour ATO, we align a sensor to a shooter, we, we get all that organized, and if you lose the sensor, or if you lose the shooter, oftentimes you don't have an alternative to line up one or the other against another system. Um, our, our, our opponents and our peers have gotten very good at countering some of our systems with affordable countermeasures of some sort. So when we wrote MDO, it became apparent that we needed resilience. When you look at convergence in, in the MDO doctrine or the MDO concept, convergence is two things. One, it's resilience in your sensors and shooters, that is to enable any shooter with any sensor through any C2 headquarters in near real time. That's, that's the aspiration. The other is, is to get the compounding effects so the total of these different capabilities is greater than some of the parts and you overwhelm your opponent. So the first point I'd like to make on Kill Web is it, this gets really hard and it's really related to MOSA because if I, if I lose my primary sensor, say it's an F-35, that is spotting a, an HVT for a long-range artillery system, if I lose that sensor, I need an alternative. What about LEO? And that, that connectivity needs to happen very well, so MOSA is really critical to that. The second factor, um, and look, applying sensors and shooters to each other has been going on for, for decades. What's unique about multi-domain operations is, and I, and I would challenge, though, yesterday I heard at least once someone talk about the unit of action being the division. 
And I would highly recommend we get that out of our lexicon. I understand it, but remember, the army of all services integrates echelons for purpose and for outcome. We integrate echelons. We don't select a special echelon. Furthermore, with multi-domain operations, we became, it became apparent that it's even more important because sometimes you'll have a tactical shooter that requires a strategic sensor or a strategic sensor that requires a tactical shooter. And so those things get harder and harder and harder. By the way, not just cross echelon, it's cross service and it, across the interagency, thinking about uh, satellites, et cetera. So it becomes a very challenging piece and we have to get it right. All right, uh, great answer, sir. And, and you can see the comment about the rate of change being important because now you're, you're moving through these different sensors and shooters and somebody's got an innovative technology or a new algorithm and, and all of a sudden you, you're like, stop the war, we need six months to integrate this new algorithm onto this uh, tactical. My shooter. favorite example is when the F-35 was fielded, it couldn't talk to the F-22. Um, the Department of Defense spent $50 million developing Link 16 so the two can talk. We've got to get away from spending $50 million every time you want two systems to right, talk. Right. Okay, great. So let's move on to that and say, okay, we've got this innovative new solution, and you get into this really, what, what is the uh, thing that causes most people to twitch, uh, the, the actual cause of this defense industrial complex I was discussing before, is contract law. I wish I had a lawyer I could call. So, um, so when you get to this idea of rapidly changing evolutionary contract structures they're going to have to support this rapid acquisition decision and this rapid integration how do we integrate um ip law precedents into this i think in, during our, our run-up susan you mentioned um in the ip cadre we've got the best and brightest that were fielded towards this really really important huge acquisition but we can't do that over and over and over again so how do we balance the need for that IP legal expertise into this rapid, multifaceted contract environment? I think first we have to talk about how do we traditionally do IP. So everybody here has something they want to sell to the government, but you also want to be able to sell it again and again and again. If you give the government what you have now without any restrictions, they can use it, they can give it to competitors. So you want to protect that, right? That's key. The other piece is the government doesn't want to have to pay again and again and again for something. And if they're going to give you money, they want rights. And so MOSA is this intersection of the government will say, we need form, fit, and function. We need OMIT, operations, maintenance, integration. You know, like we need that information to make the machines talk to each other. We need to know what we need to know. In addition, if you are not a prime, then your prime needs to know what it is that you've got. And if they want to maintain it, they're going to need to go into that box. So how do you protect your rights? How do you have something that's really worthwhile for your investors, for your companies? That's the tension of MOSA. Because the government wants what it wants so it can be resilient, so it can quickly go and upgrade, take your piece out, compete or maybe not compete, get somebody else's piece and insert it into that space. So this is the challenge that we're going to have to face. And I think you really need to be thinking about it when you're developing your stuff. Can you develop modularly? Can you develop in it something that you can swap it in today and then you can upgrade and offer an upgrade that they can swap out easily? That might be an advantage. Or is somebody else going to come in that's going to have some better solution that competitively they're going to knock you out and you'll never get to achieve all of the costs that you put into it, get that back. So that's a real challenge. Yeah, it's a real challenge. And, and I think one of, the, one of the aspects of that is both on the Army program management side, uh, as you see the transition from S&T Concepts and Army Futures Command into acquisition programs, um, you'll see a different mindset regarding data rights from uh, a company moving through that paradigm. So I think that, uh, that kind of expertise. I mean, you really have to think about it. It's not impossible. Nothing's impossible. But if you don't think about it up front, then you're going to be pushed at the end to giving up something maybe you're not ready to give up. So you really, and, But the government wants what it wants. It's very right. clear. We've listened to General Norman today. Right. You know, most is a linchpin of how do we have a faster, better, more efficient, more resilient army. And right. so how do we help them get there? 
that's the challenge. Yeah, fantastic answer. Okay, all right. So moving on, Hugh. Yeah, go ahead. I'm just going to piggyback on what you're saying. It's uh, you know interesting. I look at L3 Harris. L3 Harris kind of spans the gamut. You know, we have airborne ISR platforms uh, where we integrate a bunch of content. Uh, then there's the space that I exist in that really pulls products together, focuses on mission systems, but doesn't isn't a platform provider. We really work with platform providers. And then there's the component side. And looking at where you are in that chain really changes opinions, right? At uh, kind of the, the platform level through mission system level, I think it resonates more clearly because it's more tied to the mission. And you understand the intent, right? The intent is to speed up delivery of capabilities to really be able to counter whatever's happening in the battle space. And by the way, I think that needs to be conveyed more for whoever writes requirements and puts out RFPs. You want to win people's hearts because at the end of the day, you're asking people to implement something, right? You're going to write some definitions. I know there are several government folks in the room uh, associated with the acquisition space. You're going to write requirements. People are going to make fine level decisions on what they think that means. Knowing intent and the value it provides to the warfighter is going to change whether people follow it to the best of their ability or whether they just find a way to give a checkbox. And so it's, it's worth noting, say why. We are in this business usually for a reason. So say why, win the hearts, know the intent, make sure people know the intent so they can follow through a little better. And so at the, more at the platform level, mission system level, you have more understanding inherently uh, and so a willingness to lean out and, and to wrestle with the question of, well, how do we know we're going to make money? What does the business uh, case really look like? The business case does change. But then I even see within my own company where many product lines down at the component level, they're willing to lean out because the requirements are really clear and they know that they have to, whereas in other product lines, the requirements aren't there, the, the conveyance of value for the warfighter isn't there, and so the, the cost associated with re-architecting components, like uh, discrete products, is fairly high without the sense of intrinsic motivation from knowing the mission value uh, uh, and without seeing clear requirements saying that you know, individual discrete products are going to have to comply. And so uh, down at the product level, I, I've actually seen what is both willingness to comply fully and to a great detail, all the way to resistance, depending on the product line, because of the concern of, well, how do we make money from this? Mm -hmm. So I think it's important for the government to convey it as well. Here's how we see businesses being able to, to recoup investment when they make it so that technology can be put forward to the warfighter faster. But don't worry, we know as long as you keep investing and keep providing the best stuff, you're going to make money, and here's how. They have to be able to articulate it. So, yeah, go ahead. Pull, uh, well, I was going to say, so I mean, the key to this is um, open system standards, right? Standardize things so that you got a tank, you can put it on. You got a plane, you can put it on. And you can resell the solution because it's modular. It's going to fit in all these different places if you do it right. But if you do it, we were talking before about the brittle, like we've got that one-off solution. It only goes in one place. You need two controllers because they don't interact. So if you develop thinking open systems, I'm going to use a standard that can be put here, here, and here, there's a greater likelihood you can recover your investment and you can achieve what the government's looking for. But you have to be thinking when you're developing it, what is that standard I need? Where could it potentially go? And how can I develop it in a way that's going to be easy to put in, take off, and replace or upgrade. Right. So, that, that would force adoption of standards more broadly, too, where you actually have a cross-air ground. And I, I know that, you know, sir, you made reference to GCIA. One thing that is pretty good is I, I saw a lot of pull from the air side into GCIA, mm -hmm. which does help with reusability, which increases your ability to sell across totally different systems uh, so that you can have a business case that holds. But that adoption has to occur because if you keep redefining the new standards, right. you're not actually going to achieve the reusability and support a business case for a company to justify investment. All right. So I'm going to pull that back a little bit. I'm going to say the ability to make money and the ability to understand modularity and clear requirements, these are things that are going to be training for government procurement side. However, there's also a, a pain point, and that is that they can hide behind the standard. I mean, standards sometimes moves much slower than working innovation. And so I'm just curious, what, what perspective from a small business do you have on that? 
Well, I'll come back to the small business perspective because I think we've got a solution for that. But the other thing that makes this harder is the services aren't incentivized to move towards these standards. Right. When, when I was still on active duty, I was really pushing the JAD C2 piece hard and was trying to get the chief and the secretary and the joint force to say, hey, let's, let's define the standards for JAD C2 so that the corporations can come up underneath with, with unique solutions. That when you do that, though, they put at risk the programs that they already have in their palm and they don't want to surrender those. Both the Air Force and the Army make it very possessive, say the Army on IBCS, and they don't want to surrender that program because that's dollars in the palm. That's a really dysfunctional budgeting scenario when you can't advance because your standards are tied to a program of record that bring, brings in revenue. Um, to your question, you know, a small company like Parasanti, I think um, for us most is a good thing because we want to solve this problem. Um, you know, there's three areas I look at. I'm a tanker, so I keep it simple. Uh, you know, you've got open standards. Um, the second one is growth capacity, and, and the third one is universality. Open standards from a Parasanti perspective is like pushing a string uphill. We don't know what tomorrow brings. It's got whatever we build has got to be future proof, and any new thing could come in with a capability that we really want, but is based on a proprietary. Uh, connector that requires something different. So you will never be able to see the future in a way that open standards will, will be, you won't open standard your way through this problem. I think we need them, but it's not going to solve the, the problem. The second is um, growth capacity. If I could just diverge for a minute, Jeff, you, I loved your brief and your great CFT director, but one of the things we need is aspirational is growth capacity. Um, when I know that some of you go to church when God created the heavens and the earth, he established a law and that is armored vehicles will grow in weight in every <laughs> It's just a truism. The Booker tank right now is it, or is it capacity? That's crazy talk. Open, uh, co growth capacity is open architecture because it allows you to bring more things in. And then really to your point, uh, universality that is to be future proof um, Rather than looking at it from this direction and saying, how can I get everybody on the same sheet of music? What if you had an ability to translate connectors using artificial intelligence so that you don't have to write original code every time you bring in a new system? When you do hang an ornament on the tree, you've got an ability to look at the metadata on two, from two directions and within minutes, be able to create a connector so that you can get to universality and be future-proof. That's what Parasanti does. So we're happy for the MOSA problem because we think we're going to solve it. Yeah, that's a great plug. Um, and also a recognition that uh, many of the aspects that are slowing, that would slow us down in terms of uh, cooperative engagement, cooperative development, uh, real-time realization of, of a standardized interface rather than a standard-centric interface, I think is important, right? We create the standardized interface at the point of need, and we agree that in order for us to, to achieve the rate of change, you know, we also need to not be held hostage to whatever the standard said yesterday. We need to recognize that the working solution should drive a standard as a standardizable interface. Right. Um, you're still so going to have standards, though, in when you create a data model, you're data modeling to something from someone's commercial sure. product. Right. And so that still has to be well defined sure. to support all the sort of features you want. And that does handle the software side, but you still have to have the hardware side. So you have true separability right. of systems. Right, and so we have these we have these layered interoperable standards uh, that create a framework for us to be able to make a solution specific architecture. We and we have these architectural frameworks that help us do that in a way that ensures that we're taking the burden of integration risk reduction off of the requirement writer, so that they could focus on the specific fit and function standard. Uh, so you had. A I, I mean, I was going to say, I think the way you're thinking of buying isn't the way the government buys, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, the government doesn't buy, I want this from column A, this from column B, and this from column C. It says, you, this is the solution I want, give it to me. Mm -hmm. And so you, that entity, whoever, uh, God forbid I say the word lead systems integrator, whoever that entity is that's putting everything together, you have to figure it out. And so everybody in the room has to figure out how do we create these standards so we can work together? Right. And how do I give them that information that they need? And so when they build it, we were talking yesterday about building a solution 
that's going to be stovepiped right. versus one that's web-based where you can plug and play much more easily. Yeah, so, so I think the real select success is going to be building a not stovepipe solution right. that you're going to be able to evolve because when we talk about the POMs, we talk about the budgets, you do get locked into, I only have O&M money, I only have this kind of money, I don't have the other kind of money. Yeah. And so you have to kind of fit it within, and MOSA may enable you to do that more easily. Right, and we need to work within the framework we have. So um, show of hands, anyone actually read the Title X legal descriptions of Modular Open Systems Approach? I know you did. <laughs> I, well, I have two, and it's only 15 pages printed. I'll send you a PDF file. Anyone wants that, you know, uh, make sure there's a great DAU class uh, on, on how, to, how to decipher that. But it's really readable. It's, it's surprisingly readable. And, uh, and, and it identifies that modular open systems approach, not architecture, because the architecture is that underpinning thing that you're going to do, but the approach is holistic. It's your approach to budgeting. It's your approach, approach to industry involvement. It's your approach to your to core acquisition strategy and how you're going to understand the things that are drivers. So it's, it's actually very well written. Um, and so I'd encourage you to go read that. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's very accessible. Um, but the important part is that you're, you're developing something where you're going to need to address the tools that you have because it, it's hard to change the budgeting cycle. So right. how do you work within that? You, you have to start working with your peers in the acquisition force to be able to say, well, do we have budget together? Do we have commonality in our requirements? So, so as an integrator, as, a, as somebody who is going to look at um, I, I've got a business unit that's targeting this particular customer with these particular products, and we've got a long lead cycle, and you know we've we've spent time, and then a curveball gets thrown in. Say, hey, we've got this innovative small business. Can you can you wire that in? Uh, what kind of approaches does that affect for this rapid integration of new technologies? Yeah, yeah I think you you look at even uh, the discussion around modular admission payloads, which is more of a concept than a reality at this mm -hmm. point. Um, and when you think of that and how quickly you may want to change some, uh, some sort of function out, I think that's maybe how it's bought. Because it, the, I think the detail is where do you draw the line on having defined standards for separability? And I, personal opinion, I think you look at what sort of functions are you trying to achieve? Because if you make it too granular, well, then you end up for all the, the people that have these great businesses that have a specific capability, if you try to break apart their system too much where it doesn't work or uh, it feels disconnected to the point where they worry what their business case looks like because they are tiny, tiny little pieces, um, then you lose the, the, the drive of industry to answer to your needs, right? But if you make it too big, well, then you can't break it apart. But if you think in terms of functions, I want to buy this sort of function uh, then you define the interfacing associated with it if it's not already there. You could create the data models so that uh, if they have something that, that gets down to an individual feature right. you may within their system, you could uh, do that translation. But ultimately, thinking in terms of buying units of capability and then worry about how those interfaces are defined uh, for that, that type of function you're trying to purchase, I think that helps because, again, you think of you know, someone who's trying to package a whole system together, you, again, I'm thinking in terms of modular mission payloads, when you're gonna grab, you got these optics, you want this sort of processing, this sort of exploitation occurring, you want all those to be severable. Why? Because you know they're gonna change, some of those things change really, really fast, right. really fast. So you know you want them to be severable, but you should define the function itself and put the boundary there and not forcibly break apart something that makes no sense just because you're trying to get some severability you don't need down at a granular level that loses the hearts and minds of the people making it. Yeah, so there's a, there's a, a really challenging Goldilocks problem associated with how much modularity is enough modularity yeah. so that I can still assemble a system. And that requires a, a real uh, warfighter in the loop integration for what is actually going to change, yeah. right? So vehicle protection is a really good example. Um, what, what's going to change? Is it the entire vehicle protection system that I just need to bolt on and remove, or is it the parts of it? Is it the sensor? Is it the algorithm? And so there are some obvious things like separating the hardware from the software. 
and ensuring that we have a clearly defined way to integrate software at the rate of change that we need to without saying, hey, I need to refresh the hardware just because somebody's got a business case right. for it. Instead, it's I need to refresh the hardware because something is broken and I need to grab a piece of hardware that works. All right, so I want to I want to leave some time uh, for for audience questions as much as we can, but I've got one more kind of redirect uh, that that we're going to bring in here, and it and it is how do we enable rates of change uh, in these independent areas that are going to drive us forward? I'm going to use the data model example, and I'll I'll talk about some uh, how to write better contracts example, and I'm going to tie that to artificial intelligence. All right, so um, we will often do um, we will take the hardest edge case problem. And we will add all of the additional complexity, and then we'll focus on what the modular open systems uh, need to be out in the in the field. And we've got all these other things that delay us in the process from getting there. So if I, I posited a, a, a comment at the beginning that that MOSA is about uh, at, at its underlying capability, it is the enabler that that gets us to a rapid rate of change. It allows us to build in overmatch to the system, and so. Um, there are things that we can do that will help us speed up our processes, like, you know, writing better contracts. So rather than just focusing on the tactical capability, um, I, I used a little, uh, a little example with our panel here, and, and I, I used an AI uh, assistant uh, chatbot to, to kind of create the, the questions for us and sent it off to, you know, we, we, we sent, you know, how good is AI at doing something really simple, like just build the agenda for this. Build, build me my documentation. So applying that and, and stretching it a little bit, how can AI support integration documentation for deliverables? How can it support contract law? How can it support um, helping you write better proposals to explain the problem set to a many-to-many -many user case? So can you think of simpler use cases where we can be accelerating our rate of change rather than just focusing on the most complicated use of autonomy or artificial intelligence? Thoughts? Can you lead off on that? Yeah, go so for it. So I'll stay on the technical side. I'll defer to Susan on the, on the requirement side. Um, a couple points. Uh, first is, and I think Jeff alluded to this earlier this morning, we, we buy things, we fight formations. Um, the problem is oftentimes we continue to behave like we buy things and fight things. As, and so the, the requirement side, you know, buying, um, you're really buying a formation. You need a formation, but we, get, we defer to buying things. So one of the things I, in terms of artificial intelligence, um, what I suggested earlier, and that is to create an automatic translator, um, is based on a generative AI model that can, it, it, rather than relying on a large language model AI, this is a teachable in, infant agent. AI is great, but it, when it requires just boatloads of data, you got to put it on a server somewhere. But if you want at the, at the formation level to connect things, you need a, an AI capability to, to develop connectors, but on a very low weight. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where we're trying to use AI to solve that problem. All right, great answer, right? Susan? No idea. Um, I mean, I just think in terms of AI is one of those things where the result you get depends on what's in your database and what that learning functionality is. So if you take AI and you're using it in one thing, you can't just translate that, put it somewhere else and say, okay, write my contract. I think um, most of it, at the beginning at least, is gonna be, we're gonna have to look at it like each individual procurement, like what, what do we need? How do we need to buy it? What are the things we're most concerned about? Um, and we've got the IP cadre, if nobody knows about it, DOD has an IP cadre headed by Richard Gray, and they are going around right now in their training, they just did a three-day training period on MOSA, trying to get people who are actually going to be writing all of your contracts to really understand what the heck they're supposed to be buying. And the issue is going to be, like, when you write the contracts, are you calling for the right requirements? Are you going to leave something open so you can switch in, switch out? Are you going to provide for a tech refresh at X? period of time or whatever, and how is that going to happen? And it's also going to be what kind of information are you going to need? So if you talk AI, all, you have to feed all of those different pieces in to know what is it I have to spit out as my contract. And I think that's going to be challenging, and you're going to have to really look at these contracts carefully and see, can I push back on this? Right. Can I add something else in? Um, and you talk about modularity, and I see that as a risk issue for small businesses or whoever is that 
underneath part because you're selling a module to the government, but you may have all sorts of different individual pieces in it. Um, some were developed wholly at private expense, some were developed wholly at government expense. The government's going to want GPR at least, government purpose rights, how am I going to give them that? And so there's going to have to be that negotiation of how do I give them what they need. So I don't think there's a universal solution right now on the AI front, but maybe in the uh, future. Maybe some aspirational directions we can head to speed up our process. Okay, great. Any, and, and I would actually uh, agree the difficulty is in the nuance of how each individual capability is developed and to ensure that there's a sustaining business case that keeps whoever is providing any given uh, you know, capability in the defense space, thinking, innovating, delivering, uh, so that we could stay ahead of the fight. And in terms of what it looks like long term, I mean, God, I don't know, we're all kind of guessing. One thing I have to chuckle at is, uh, well, when will we be willing to adopt faster in the defense space period? Um, so uh, the reality is, is in most of the larger companies, uh, and I'm going to venture to say uh, the government writ large in defense space, if you're not a small company that kind of make your own decisions, um, adoption is slow because of security concerns. And so how do you overcome the hurdles a little quicker to actually adopt faster to learn where you can offload what are, are maybe more trivial tasks? Um, and then with that is probably going to be get, how should we do acquisitions differently anyway? Because if I could auto generate a whole you know, series of volumes, then what are you really, how are you really going to test people on the quality of their design. It probably shouldn't be based on the words generated to describe something uh, quite the same way. Uh, and by the way, we should be doing more experimentation, in my opinion anyway, to really see what capabilities people have developed. So you're not just relying on a document uh, that you don't know how much rigor has gone into developing it. And you know, within the next few years, probably ought to generate it anyway. Right. And so it really begets the question of how should you be acquiring systems yeah. going forward. Yeah, I'm thinking about like all those things like uh, user manuals. So that, that uh, 18 or 20 year old in an armored formation um, who's get rapid, getting rapidly changing equipment that uh, to use the example that Nick used yesterday about uh, World War II, they had the capability, but the users weren't trained on it. To, to build some yeah. automated training aids. Okay, great. All right, it, are you guys awake yet? Um, we, we've tried to give you lots of time to warm up for questions. We've got about 10 minutes left for those questions. So let's get to it. Best question of the day. Um, Ari will buy you a beer. Okay, I just. Good morning, my name's uh, Captain Durfee. I'm with APM with uh, Coast Combat Systems. So I had a question for Ms. Uh, Ebner. You know, when we're writing requirements and writing contracts, how do we balance the need for most of standards without stifling uh, innovation uh, for the actual contractor? You're writing the requirements now? Is that what you're saying? You're writing requirements and writing contracts? While we're going through the, the requirements process and writing the contracts for uh, our programs. I mean, part of it is when you're going through the requirements phase, you obviously want to do a really good survey of what's out there so that you can customize what it is that is in your scope of work, right? So I think industry days are good. I mean, that's been my experience in the past. Uh, contractor questions and answers, kind of having that dialogue to flesh out what is there that's available. The other thing is building into contracts the idea that there would be some tech refresh you know, that there will be some opportunity, not, we're trying to get away from vendor lock, obviously, uh, and trying to make it so that the government can buy, refresh, do what it needs. So are you gonna build into your contracts this, this flexibility? Maybe it's gonna be an engineering propose, change proposal that's gonna be beneficial. Like, if you offer us refreshes and we decide it's really worthwhile, we'll give you some kind of you know, positive bonus or something, some incentive. But I think you have to incentivize people to want to embrace MOSA. You know, you want to make it really worthwhile. And so what are you going to give them? Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to also say that I, I think there are some aspects of engaging industry in a different way. Um, think about engaging industry with very, very broad, open perspectives, uh, especially looking at other programs and domains that you might not have thought of. I mean, you know, ask the guys from Army Aviation, ask the guys from Nav Air um, what they have done. Uh, talk to the Air Force Lifecycle Management Center so that you can say, rather than getting the same five cast of characters in my industry day, let's get a really broad perspective and keep everybody cooperating as long as possible. 
So I think there's some, uh, there's some good lessons there. Okay, next question. Thanks, great question. Over here in the red shirt, maybe, or for whoever gets the microphone fastest. <laughs> That's a quick question. Just interested to hear your thoughts on uh, MOSA balanced with cybersecurity and some of the challenges that might exist in terms of cybersecurity of MOSA systems. Okay, all right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick off first on that one just because this is one of my favorite questions uh, while you guys think about it. Um, you don't get security through obscurity. And uh, this, this whole idea that MOSA is just going to open up my system. So open does not mean open source. Open architecture means available, and you can have classified open architectures. Um, and so the idea that you have independent controls and independent capabilities to ensure that this function works correctly and it receives validated input, and this function receives validated input and there's validated output going out, ensures that I've got uh, not necessarily an increase in attack surface, but an increase in reliability of the individual components and securability so that I can perform patches. So I think there is a huge misunderstanding um, in, the, in, in the atmosphere at large that Madra Open Systems increases cyber vulnerabilities, and I think the exact opposite is true in a well-architected system. That's my thought. And I but... disagree. Um, I think, well, I do think there are a couple of things that are you really have to pay attention to right now. We have proposed rules that are out there that are going into effect on S-bombs, H-bombs, you know, software bill of materials, hardware bill of materials. They want attestation clauses coming from DHS on what is your provenance of what it is you're putting in there. So if you're a prime contractor or you're a sub, you really have to be working extra hard to figure out what is it that I'm going to attach mm -hmm. and how is it going to impact it. So yes, it could become more secure because you're actually paying attention to that, um, or it could be less secure if you're not paying attention to it. Yeah, good point. So you got to really watch it. All right, other thoughts? Just a real quick one. I'm not a cyber guy. I'll answer from an operator's perspective or a commander's perspective. Sometimes cyber is like uh, force protection or ethics. And we can use it as a reason to not do something. You know, I remember, you know, I'm not, you know, we used to say force protection is the essence. You don't want to lose any soldier. If you don't want to lose any soldier, then just don't deploy. Um, and, you, and you'll win that one. So same with cyber, right? So I think that you, you're, you're striking. The point is that there is a balance there. But ultimately, I, I think the purpose of, of, of cyber is protection, whereas the purpose of your tool, your weapon system, is to, is to dominate. And so both have to be in place, and you can't let the former... Uh, Paralyzing. Right. And to that end, the, what goes through my mind is it's not worth the cost of losing speed of putting technology to the field, right? right? If you have the well-defined interfaces so that people keep developing and developing and developing to them so that you could field systems faster, 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 at the end of the day, like I think at this point, and again, not cybersecurity expert, but hung out with uh, enough of them to hear some things, um, you're going to assume that you're... Uh, you're vulnerable no matter what. There will be intrusion somewhere. That's almost given at this point. And how are you really actively monitoring for that uh, intrusion? And, I, and to your point, making really obscure interfaces shouldn't be your protection mechanism because it's not worth the cost of losing speed of capability to the fight. Right. Uh, okay, great. Do we have time for one more question or are we getting the... We got time for one more question. Okay. All right, guy back um, there. rock, guys. paper, scissors, you guys. One, okay. <laughs> All right, go for it. I guess step back and look at the MOSA and that's what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, we can start looking at your modernization on the platform. How do you incentivize that for, you know, folks, folks here to, to be able to participate in modernization through open standards? Okay, so modernization of existing platforms and incentives for people to participate in open standards. I think there's... There's an undercurrent in that question, let me validate this uh, as we answer here, um, that MOSA only occurs in clean sheet design, might as well throw away the entire invested inventory of warfighting capability that we have that's not MOSA enabled. And I think that's a false assumption. I think we can prove that that's a false assumption, that there is a huge business case for modernizing. If we had to fight tonight, we have to modernize tomorrow because the, the threat has a vote and we will have to adapt. So MOSA on the enduring systems and modernization of those systems is a, is a present tense warfighting reality that we have to deal with. Um, so the incentive for the DOD, I think, is there. They just have to embrace that that is the reality and, and they can't put it off. How do you incentivize the small businesses and the innovative middle tier businesses and the large businesses to get involved 
um, has a has an interesting question about like principal agent, right? The government has to take the first step because everybody's going to follow what they do. Um, so thoughts on that? I'll just give you a quick one. You know, as, as a small business, I think what you're asking is how do you participate in modernization of legacy or current systems? And uh, I love my AAL friends, but the first thing I do is open that garage door upstairs and keep it open. And, and what AAL is supposed to be is the front door to the United States Army in terms of modernization. There's got to be a place where, where those small businesses can say, hey, I need help. Huh, I need a server. I need cash. How, how would you do this? And that's the instruction um, venue, at least the entry point, to do that. I think I would think of it multi-pronged, multi right? I do a lot in the consortium area. Consortiums are, the idea is, it's like SIBRs. You can do SIBRs under consortiums also. You know, what's your sweet spot? Is it going to be AAL? Is it going to be NAMC? Is it going to be vertical lift? Whatever it is, it's going to be spectrum. And they have industry days where they talk about what is it that the government needs. Go to the industry days. You've got a solution. They were saying, come upstairs to our meetings and tell us, you know, I have something that might answer that question. Get that transparency. Um, the other thing is, like, all of the primes or all of the mid-tiers, they all have small business subcontracting plans. They need small businesses to come in to satisfy their goals. If you've got something really useful, they all have industry days. Go and start talking to the ones that are most likely to need your solution and let them know you've got it. Um, but don't forget to sign an NDA, please. <laughs> the, the great difficulty there is you have gatekeepers. And in, until opinion, uh, until the government actually specifies uh, for modernizing these vehicles going forward, any major uh, subsystem upgrades, uh, we are going to ensure that they, you know, follow the modular open systems approach. Uh, when they define it so that it segments off and that you do upgrades of whole kit for a vehicle where you've specified for all this new kit we're about to upgrade, it has to follow all those standards and we can procure it uh, and we can, you know, vet the technologies that are out there. That then removes gatekeepers. Until that happens, you're still like begging for a meeting with someone who you hope they care and you hope they integrate them and you'll see if your stuff makes it in. And so if you really want to increase that speed to get new capabilities into uh, legacy vehicles to modernize them, the government has to actually say, for major vehicle upgrades from here on out, we will ensure this occurs and we will have the ability to see what capabilities are going on and be able to, to help direct them because we know that the open interfaces will be in place. Great. And I, I'm going to actually take that point to say, for those that haven't read Title 10, which is almost everybody in the room, those 15 pages, that authority is now a requirement. It's a statutory requirement for any acquisition program to include a modular open system approach. So. The answer is, if you're not doing MOSA, you're breaking the law. Yeah. I was going to say, there's also a proposed rule out right now for the DFAR for MOSA. If you want to get involved, please go and read the proposed rule and make comments, because if we don't have people commenting on whether it's workable or not workable and how it needs to be tweaked, it's not going to come out right. Awesome. All right, round of applause for our uh, panelists. Great job, guys. That was awesome. A lot of fun. And thank you all for your hospitality. Yeah, thank you, John, and huge thanks to the panelists for that incredible discussion. Uh, we've definitely earned a break, so let's go ahead and, and take a break. Rough, we've got about 10 minutes, and uh, we'll come back here and, and be seated and ready to go for our, our second and final panel of the morning uh, at 1130.
Okay.
Thanks. We'll get started here in, in a couple of minutes. This will be our, our, our second and final panel for the, the first half of the day. Um, so if you could just start making your way back to your seats, and, and again, we'll get started in a couple of minutes. Thank you. process okay let's uh let's go ahead and find our our seats we'll go ahead and uh and get started again for our this will be our, our second and, and final panel for first half of the day plenty plenty of room yeah and then and then again just as a reminder um we do have have lunch catered as an option, and that's that's thanks to the uh, AUSA Central Texas chapter. I think we've got one of the chapter president here in here somewhere, Mr. Gary Patterson. But um, as everyone starts to, to file in, uh, I'll go ahead and, and introduce the, the moderator of, of, our, of our panel today. Um, we could advance to, to the next slide there. So, All right, I think we're still corralling some, some folks. We'll give them just a, just a second. There we go, awesome. So, uh, so this, this second panel, um, working with government non-traditional methods, so it kind of ties into a lot of the discussion going on from the, the, the MOSA panel, and then, you know, as well as the, the, the uh, yesterday's sort of discussions throughout the day. And uh, I'm excited to, to introduce our, our moderator, Mr. David Bonfili. Uh, David is the the CEO and co-founder of, of Acme General Solutions, which is a, uh, a boutique professional services company that has ex extensive experience working with uh, national security to include Army Applications Lab and, and various other organizations across the Army. So uh, welcome, David, and I'll have you bring your, your panel up and introduce them. All right, sounds uh, good. Uh, mic check, is this coming through okay? I hear a little echo, but good. Okay, all right, come on out, everyone. Let's. Uh get this fired off as I think we're the last panel here between right. people and lunch. The coveted position. <laughs> the prime, the prime position. Um, so I want to welcome everyone for coming today to this panel on non-traditional uh, ways of working with the government. Uh, I think in part this panel came out of some feedback that the uh, Army Applications Lab and AFC have gotten from prior Vertex events around people coming in, particularly smaller non-traditional companies, 
saying this was really useful and learning about what the government is interested in and the problem sets they have. Now, what do I do about it? How do I work with them? And AAL has been good about having some solicitations, typically, that come out after this that are relevant to the topic on hand, but sort of bigger picture, what are the avenues for engagement? What do those look like? So the last panel was a nice lead-in, talking about modular open system architecture and the relevance for partnering uh, with other people. On the panel today, we've got three really interesting folks, both in the positions that they're currently in, um, and in some cases, in the roles they've been in previously. So I want to go through the introductions. I'm going to use my glasses for this, because I've reached the age where I can't read without them, but can't see you with them. <laughs> And, uh, and then we'll dive in. Uh, so first to my left, we have Warren Sponsler uh, from the National Advanced Mobility Consortium, or NAMSI. Um, Warren, prior to uh, joining NAMSI as Senior Director for Strategic Growth and Communications, served 26 years uh, in the Army at a variety of levels in both combat and peacetime, overseas tours in Bosnia and Kuwait, three combat deployments to Iraq between 2003 and 2011, which for those of you in Iraq was like three different wars, uh, at least during that time. Um, he also served as both the senior live fire trainer and senior brigade combat team trainer at the Army's National Training Center in Fort Irwin. Uh, it's Bachelor of Science in Systems Engineering from West Point to Master's in Military Studies from the Marine Corps University, URAP. Was selected as a U.S. Army Senior Service College Fellow with the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Security Studies Program in Cambridge. Uh, and his Army career culminated, and this is pretty relevant for our discussion here, um, as the Deputy Director and Chief of Staff for uh, Army Futures Command's Next Generation Combat Vehicles Cross-Functional Team uh, at Detroit Arsenal in Michigan. Uh, next, we have Mark Frank from BAE Systems. Mark is a Technical Director at BAE, overseeing the ground vehicle portfolio with the Integrated Survivability Solutions product line. In his 19 years with BAE, he's primarily focused on ground vehicle survivability, including soft kill countermeasures, 360 situational awareness systems, and countermine systems. He also spent seven years with Fallbrook Technologies, leading product development as the director of engineering. He has an MS in engineering from the University of Texas at Austin, uh, and a BS in mechanical engineering from Virginia Tech. Uh, finally, we have Mark Milner uh, from American Ryan Mittal. Uh, Mike uh, has served as vice president for business development and strategy, uh, at Ryan Mittal Vehicles, where he has overall responsibility for identifying opportunities and developing strategies to capture future DoD businesses in support of Ryan Mittal's Vehicle Systems Division. Prior to joining Ryan Mittal, Mike spent over 30 years in the Army in operational, contracting, and modernization organizations. As an armor officer, he served in multiple cavalry uh, regiments overseas, uh, culminating in troop command with the 3rd ACR. Uh, he then went into the Army Acquisition Corps, where he spent 10 years providing contract support to Army operations overseas, ultimately serving as the commander of the Defense Contracting Management Agency in Italy. Uh, he subsequently served as a program manager, where he was selected to lead the Army's ACAT-1 Excalibur program, producing a first-of-its-kind cannon-fired guided artillery projectile. Uh, following graduation from the U.S. Army War College and a position on the Army staff supporting the Army Acquisition Executive, he was selected to lead the effort to replace the M113 family of vehicles as project manager for the 15 billion armored multipurpose vehicle program. He holds a bachelor's from Georgia State University, an MBA from Clemson, and a master's from the U.S. Army War College, and also level three certified in contracting and program management. So that's the panel that we have today, really interesting backgrounds. What I'd like to do before we dive in is actually get a sense for who's out here that we're talking to so we can try and calibrate the discussion. So maybe if I can just do kind of a quick show of hands for people who out here right now is in the government. Okay. Uh, who is in uh, academia or an investor? Okay. Who's in industry? All right. Now keep your hands up in industry. <laughs> Put your hands down if you're part of what you would consider the traditional defense industrial base. All right. Put your hands down if you are familiar with OTA consortiums. OK, that's helpful. So what we're trying to do here is provide a little structure to really take it out to all of you to ask questions, because it, it's no point in us trying to predict what you're interested in when you're sitting there and probably know. Um, so we're going to try and go pretty quickly through the panel. And what I'd like is, as you have questions, don't feel like you have to wait to 10 minutes in or 20 minutes in 
raise your hands as I come along. Uh, I'll try and see you and call on you. I should note uh, that I have no peripheral vision on the right side. And so if you're over here, you may need to like wave your hands kind of furiously. I'll try and spin around and, uh, and look at you occasionally. Um, so with that, let me start with Warren. And you know, it sounds like, looks like we have decent familiarity with OTA consortiums. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can talk specifically about NAMSI and what you're seeing in terms of interfacing with non-traditional companies within sure. the consortium, sort of what's working and, and, and what's not, and, and sort of what the opportunity set looks like from your perspective. Yeah, absolutely. So our uh, organization, we're based out of Southeast Michigan. Uh, as a consortium, and our, our business is essentially focused on all things ground vehicles, uh, ground systems in the mobility space. Uh, our, our major uh, customer support is the Ground Vehicle System Center. And as a as sort of a, a fundamental concept, bridging between industry and the government is essentially what, what our role is, what our mission is. So, um, you know, th that being said, I think that one of the challenges that we frequently come across is that there's small companies or non-traditional companies that are a little daunted, uh, to say the least, about doing business with the Department of Defense. Um, they'll go to events, they'll go to meetings, they'll meet program managers, they'll talk to folks. It's like, how do I even get started? Like, how do I even get this get this rolling? And so, um, what, what we try to do um, as a, a part of our business is we try to find opportunities where those small businesses can interact both with the government and I think just as, if not more importantly, to interact with um, other companies for collaborative teaming events or other things that they can do to help. Um, maybe they have a, a thing or a, a service, a capability, a technology that they can deliver that's part of a larger uh, proposal, a larger, larger package that normally they wouldn't even com compete with necessarily on a, on a contract or something. So that's a big part, I think, about what we do. It's sort of a fundamental baseline about how consortiums and, and uh, can help to bring small, non-traditional businesses sort of into the fold. Because it is very daunting, we hear it all the time, you know, about folks really, they just don't, they just don't get it, you know, how to be able to, they start looking at all the requirements to be able to, you know, just submit paperwork and it's not easy. So um, I think that that's, that's one of the bigger roles that we, that we try to perform um, is to try to bring those folks together. Can you give us a, a little sense of the, the sort of breakout of the membership in an OTA like yep. NAMC, big versus small, and also maybe yeah. in terms of, members who actively engage in working on task orders versus members who attend meetings, but sure. maybe don't? Yeah, so our, uh, and I'll talk about ours, because I know most, of course, about ours, and we've got about 500 members uh, that are part of our consortium. Uh, they range all kinds of different businesses. We have traditional, large uh, defense contractors, the, you know, the ones that we typically know of that build the systems that we're, that we're seeing behind us here. Um, we have non-traditional companies, uh, about two thirds of our members are non-traditional. So those are companies that, you know, do a lot of business in other spaces other than the DOD, less than, less than 50% within the DOD. Um, we have academic organizations, not a, not a ton, but about, I think we're at about 14 right now, academic organizations that are part of the, part of the consortium. We have, um, small businesses, about two thirds of our members are also small businesses. Um, and we've got some nonprofits as a part of the, the membership as well. So, you know, it, pretty, it runs a, a pretty wide gamut. Um, you know, there's a, there's a sort of a common misnomer, I think, out there that there's like a select few companies that every opportunity, you know, we're like, as soon as an opportunity comes out, we're, we're giving them a call saying, hey, you get a bid on this, you got to do this, do that. We, none of that actually happens. Um, we're, we're kind of much more, I guess, and much more focused on trying to bring in as much competition as we can. So. You know, my, I guess going back to my, my previous life, you know, I'm a big believer in the more that we can bring competition to the government, the better the solution is going to be. And so the more that we can encourage folks who come into the consortium or come into those competitions with innovative solutions that are going to raise the level of competition and raise the level of performance, the better off that we are. Um, so they're, they're um, each, we, we have about 15 technology areas that we're focused in on based on this most recent contract this most recent OTA that we did get with uh, with the Ground Vehicle System Center. And of those uh, 15, um, we really strive to make sure that we have sufficient um, uh, membership with technical capabilities that can actually perform in all of those 15 areas so that whenever those projects and those efforts, those task requests, those requirements do come from the government, we, you know, we've got a really good bench of strong performers to be able to participate. 
Uh, but again, there, the, the truth is, though, with, a, with this structure, um, there are some members of ours that will never directly bid on a contract. They just won't ever, it just won't meet their requirement. They, they won't have uh, the, the broad technical capability or whatever. So again, that's when I go back to this idea of teaming and collaboration mm -hmm. and um, trying to strive forward to find opportunities where they can do that. Do you find that some of those 15 technical areas are more conducive to non-traditionals than others, and, and sort of if so, which? And do you find that non-traditionals typically are partnering with a traditional partner in bidding, or often bidding independently, or, or with a consortium of non-traditionals? So I, I think it's a little bit of both, uh, um, or all, I should say. I think that there are some technical areas that definitely uh, lean into more of the traditional defense contractors that have been involved in the business for a long period of time. You know, one of the spaces that we have is uh, autonomy and, and, and connectivity. We, we help the government with the RTK program. We're helping to facilitate some things there. Um, and of course, there's a ton of people who are playing out there in the autonomy space. And so, you know, pulling in companies that have significant work in the commercial environment uh, to help bring perhaps a, a way to solve a particular problem. They may not have the whole solution, but they may have aspects of it that we want to bring in. So uh, I do think that there are um, some that definitely move themselves more towards some of those uh, sort of non-traditional or smaller businesses than others. Um, and again, we're, we're always on the lookout. So we're always, uh, we actually have a big study going on right now looking at all those technology areas to identify where we have some gaps so that we can actively sort of pull in some folks from the commercial space uh, to help our perform in those. Awesome, thanks. Mark, let me, let me turn to you. you know, we, we hear a lot about the need for non-traditional companies to partner with the large mm -hmm. system integrators, the primes, to, to get into programs and to get scale quickly as a representative of that. And as someone who's sitting as a technical director, not sort of sitting in corp dev or um, in right. one of the sort of accelerator labs, what, what does that look like from your perspective? How do you find companies to partner with and, and what are some of the challenges and opportunities that you see in trying to partner with companies that are less part of the established defense industrial base? Sure. Um, I think, first off, it's really important for us to, to find these companies that have unique and discriminating technologies because as big, and, as big as BAE is, we can't possibly you know, develop all the technologies that we need for our wide range of products that we've got. And, and I'm speaking from the electronic systems segment of BAE, not the platforms and solutions that builds the vehicles that you're probably very familiar with, but we're building black boxes that go on aircraft and various high-tech pieces of equipment um, that are using the latest technologies. And so we really need to find the companies that are immersed in those technologies and breaking new ground and bring those in to our product line. Um, and because we have a wide range of products and a wide range of opportunities that we're always pursuing, there's always a competition for investment dollars of what we're going to fund for internal development. And so we pick certain technologies that we're going to focus on that we believe are core to, to our business. And then we go looking for partners for other technologies to help flush out our product and, uh, and bring discriminating capabilities. And so it's so important to us that we actually have people whose whole job it is, is to go find, uh, find companies, small companies. We have a tech scouting arm. They're, they frequent this place as well as other places like this across the country, finding small companies that have technologies that are important. And they bring them to the business areas to see if there's a match. I mean, I probably meet with a half a dozen to 10 companies a year that tech scouting brings to me for my product areas just to say, hey, we think you might be interested in this technology. Is there a fit here? Um, we try to you know, assess the fit, and then we try to see if there's some opportunities to work together, whether it's through an OTA, which is a great opportunity, uh, which really kind of requires a large company to find a non-traditional partner to do some, per the law, for some significant portion of the work um, so, so in order to play in those competitions, we, we have to have a partner. Um, and then even just for more, maybe more traditional acquisitions, we still need those discriminators that will set our products apart from, from other companies. And so we're still looking for those discriminating technologies. 
when you talk about the tech scouts, are you talking about Fast Labs or a, a That's right. Different group? Yeah, within our Fast Labs organization, which is our R&D organization within BAE, we have people who are, are dedicated to finding new technologies, new companies that are working on new technologies. So if you think about this from the perspective of a non-traditional on the outside who wants to work with BAE, what does that look like? Do they wait for Fast Labs to find them? Do they go to Fast Labs? Do they go directly to your area if your area is relevant? How does, how does that yeah. mutual awareness work? And, and to an earlier point that you made about the company focusing on developing some technologies internally and looking externally for others, if I'm on the outside, how am I aware of what those areas are where you're looking for external providers? Uh, good questions. And with a company with as diverse a portfolio as ours, it's not an easy one to answer. Uh, so I'll take a stab at it. But um, events like this, you know, we're usually represented in Capital Factory events. We've got offices in the Capital Factory, so you can find us pretty easily here uh, or through our Fast Labs organization that, uh, that leads our, you know, search for, for companies. Um, you can also contact us directly through our BD folks are usually at uh, various industry days and events um, that if there's an area of interest that you're, that you're pursuing, uh, feel free to, you know, to, to, to reach out and touch uh, somebody from BAE who can probably find you the right point of contact to get with us. Um, the, um, and then, you know, once, you know, once we establish that, you know, we try to be very careful about our interactions with, with small businesses. I mean, the first meeting, we usually, we start it by telling them we don't have an NDA in place. Do not tell us anything that's proprietary. We don't want to know. Uh, let's have a general introduction to your company. What are you doing? Uh, what Susan can you tell us, uh, you know, about your, about your company? And then if there seems to be some common points of interest, then we can set up an NDA uh, once we, when we encourage them to put, the companies to put anything that they think might be proprietary in those NDAs so that they're well covered before we move on to the next discussions to really dive in and see if there's a, see if there's a, a, a commonality, a common point of interest that we could work together. You know, once we find that, then we're looking for an opportunity and, and working with a BAE um, or another large prime, I mean, from our perspective, we don't, we work as a prime most of the time with a subcontractor who's a small business or non-traditional, but we also work as a subcontractor to that small business or that non-traditional for something maybe like an SBI or something where maybe you think you have the right solution, but you don't have all the expertise and you need some help. And we're happy to serve that role as well of saying, okay, well, you know, we could perform some of these functions for you to, to support you. Um, we also do things like write letters of support for SBIRs and other, you know, avenues of um, potential funding for small companies and just try to, uh, you know, give them opportunities to succeed, develop that technology, which we obviously ultimately hope we can fold into a product one day when the right opportunity comes along for us. Uh, uh, no, thank you for that. Mike, I, I suspect this audience is relatively familiar with Ryan Mittal uh, to begin with, but maybe if you could give us a, a little context on the company and American Ryan Mittal in particular. Um, what I'm curious about is Mark alluded to how difficult it is sometimes to navigate and work with the sort of BMF <laughs> primes that are out there. Ryan Mittal is more of a midsize uh, prime, so what does that look like from, from your perspective? And Echoing the question that I asked Mark, how do you find the companies to work with and how do the companies find you? How do they understand where you're looking for capability? So, so American Rheinmetall Vehicles is one of three different operating companies that uh, American or Rheinmetall Defense has within the United States. We also have American Rheinmetall Munitions, American Rheinmetall uh, Systems that deals on the electronic side. Um, we were a very small company just four or five years ago. We started in 2019. I think we had four people total assigned a, or uh, employed by ARB directly. I retired in 2020. I was number six. Um, we just breached over 200 last year. Or no, I'm sorry, last month. And we're on our way to 300 next year. The um, reason I say all that that way is where are all those government people in, in there? Who else from the government? I, I, I bring that up because I'm here today because my parent company, Rheinmetall, made a huge investment in American Rheinmetall vehicles in regards to the OMFE, now XM30 program. 
And they did that because the U.S. Army indicated a willingness to ensure that other competition could be made available. And Warren hit the nail on the head. One thing we've seen is a change in behavior across the community when the competition's applied. That's my pick for that. But uh, in terms of, you know, where are we in terms of a size of a company, I would still say we're very small in mind in terms of how we operate. Um, our, our, we are foci mitigated from our parent in Germany, so we're, we're totally controlled by our managing director here and our board of directors here in the U.S. with our three inside directors. Um, so we can make decisions very fast. Like when you talked about not putting NDAs in place before you have your first meeting, especially with a small company who can tend to turn those fast, we can turn those usually within a day or less if we wanted to turn an NDA. Working with BAE, GD, other company, bigger companies we've, we've talked with, it takes a little longer to turn those in, those NDAs, just, just an example. We can make decisions very quick in terms of whether or not we incorporate product or capability into our designs. Um, so we, we have that, we still have that nimble mindset. We haven't reached that, that, that part of the developmental process and, and product growth where we have thrown so many processes on it to maintain control over a large organization that it slows everything down. So we're, we're still very nimble nimble in terms of a small business. We, we like to call ourselves a startup, but uh, we are starting starting to uh, to grow to the point where we have to start putting some of that in. Still super eligible, less than that. Uh, well, we are. It, <laughs> less than I, 500 so, people so in US So whereas we are qualified as a large business, <laughs> according to how they qualify it, we are a non-traditional defense contractor because we have not uh, participated in some of the contracts that, that make you a traditional defense contractor yet. So we, we're another way we can act pretty quickly and, and the reach back we have into our parent corporation in terms of in terms of all the product development pipeline and all the products that they have back there and their product development pipeline and we can help inform that as well. So I, I have another question I want to pose to, to all three of the panelists, but I also want to turn around and remind all you as you have questions, please go ahead and raise your hands because I, I can do this like until you're all hungry and want lunch, but I want to make sure you have a chance to uh, ask questions as well. So be, before we do that though, um, one of the things that I often find to be the most helpful are sort of case studies of success. And so if, if I could, and, and maybe Warren, we can start with you and sort of go, go down so you two have the benefit of thinking about it a little more. Um, as you think about non-traditionals coming into NAMC and really benefiting from membership in the organization, getting on work orders, delivering for programs, like what's an example of success that you can point to and, and why do you think that yeah. it was as successful as it was? So uh, the first example that comes to mind, I've been with the company now for just a little over a year. And just as I was coming on, uh, we were moving forward. Uh, the Army was with the Robotic Combat Vehicle Program, which we've heard a couple of comments about today. So I'll talk about that one. I know Steve Herrick, I think he ducked out of here, but he was here earlier as the program manager. But so that that was a, that is a program that is going through uh, through our consortium and through our OTA. It was actually on the last uh, previously awarded contract, but we're doing some still doing some work today on it. And um, shortly after I came onto the team um, in my where I work up in Sterling Heights, we hosted an industry day uh, to help facilitate basically the government, give the government an opportunity to talk about where the requirements were going. The draft RFP was out. The final RFP had not yet gone out. And uh, so we were hosting basically a collaboration event um, with a couple of different focuses. The CFT gave a conversation about, you know, where the requirements were going to go, the use cases. Um, so that was all good. Uh, and then after sort of that initial morning portion, and it was open to all of our members to come to, to participate um, in the event. We put out an invite, you know, we, is it, very, it was an in-person thing. Um, and then shortly after, uh, sort of that initial morning sort of uh, salvo of, of data dump, um, the government team, the program managers, and uh, the requirements folks all went to sort of a back room and did one-on-ones with a lot of the, the primes, those that were anticipated to come in as, as prime contracts. Some of you are here today, as a matter of fact, they were part of that. So they went back and did their thing in the back, and while that was happening, uh, our smart idea, I guess, was to host sort of a small business um, venue where we gave basically a lightning round. So in, the, in a bigger venue, we had about, uh, I think, room for about 130 people or so. Uh, businesses could get up. They could give about a, I think we limited it to about an eight, eight to five to eight minute pitch about essentially the capabilities that you offer. And then from that, um, 
you know, you could basically go offline then with folks. And we had folks from the primes in the room. We had folks from the government in the room and others. So it, it was pretty successful. Um, I, I think there was a lot of good conversation that came out of that. And I think the result was, at least the feedback that we got back from the government, was whenever the proposals actually went in for uh, the RCB program, they saw a much higher level of collaboration and teaming among a lot of smaller businesses that were part of those proposal teams. So to me, that's a big win. And it was a big sort of encourager for us to start looking at other opportunities to do in that. And so the next step that we're looking to kind of evolve this to is, um, in some cases, the program managers are very excited about doing industry days. Um, in other cases, they're less so. And kind of what we have decided is as a sort of a service to our members, we're trying to find opportunities where if the government won't host an industry day, then we will host our own. We can't call it an industry day because, you know, that'll get all kinds of trouble. But it's sort of a, essentially a collaboration event where we can help to sort of where are the needs, where are the gaps, and then we'll try to align um, folks from our membership with those technical capabilities that can then potentially come in and team. So that's, that's the first example, I guess, that, that comes up about how we, can, how we can do some of that. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Mark, how about you? Yeah, so, I mean, I can think personally of a few different experiences in my past where we worked with, with small companies. We're working with one, a local Austin company out of our Austin office here right now to help develop our ne next generation of our soft skill product. Um, and that's been a really great relationship. But we Did that talked... company come in through Fast Labs? Uh, yes. Okay. And then uh, we talked before this panel about uh, the mentor program, the protege mentor program that the mm -hmm. DOD has. And we've had some really good successes through that. We've had four companies that we've worked with through that mentor program. And I, I, I think they've all been ones that we consider a success from our perspective, from the small business perspective and from the DOD perspective. I think one example of that was uh, we, were, we have a subsystem that goes into THAAD and we had a very complex component of that subsystem, and we had a single source. And so we worked with a small business to develop a second, we wanted to develop a second source for that component, used the mentor protege program to do that. And they ended up, develop, um, they hired some students from an HBCU to do some of the analysis, ended up hiring one of those students, and ended up coming up with a component that was half the cost of what, of what we were buying became our primary supplier. And so from us, from our standpoint, it was a win. We had a lower cost product and a, and a, and a good qualified sub supplier. Um, from their standpoint, they got a new employee as well as great line of business. And I think from the DOD perspective, you know, it was a win for them to get a lower priced uh, system. We've heard a fair bit of, from the department about the need for smaller companies to work with primes from the perspective of a prime, and, and then I want to come to you, Mike, but from the perspective of a, of a larger prime, outside of some things like OTAs, which have actually statutory requirements for working with small mm -hmm. businesses, do you feel that sort of language around the need to work with sm small businesses translating into an imperative to actually do it? Or is it more of a soft suggestion? I think from, so from where I sit, it's a business need that I have because I don't have all the technologies I need to be competitive on the programs that we want to win. And so I need to find partners. And so I think it's an imperative from that perspective mm -hmm. that we really need to find people who can help us fill in some of the gaps and have a more competitive product so that we can compete uh, for the, and win these programs. You know, at the end of the day, from the big, you know, you think about it, what's in it for the large company? Well, what's in it for the large company? We're about, we're about winning those jobs. So we need, we need help. And when we, get, when we get a partnership, you know, our primary focus is to make you successful in supporting us because that's part of us, you know, being successful and winning the, winning the next job and having a fielded product is to make sure you're successful. So if you don't know uh, if you don't have the, you know, the right tools to do a certain analysis, if you don't have the right expertise to, to do part of the job, you know, it, it's on the program team to figure out how to get you the help you need so that you can be successful, thereby making us successful. Mike, for you, maybe let me ask the question in two ways. They're sitting in the current seat that you're in, and I realize everything is still pretty new, but, but are there examples of, of working with non-traditionals? 
um, that you can point to in the sort of limited period of time. But then the sort of second part of the question is, you know, your background is coming out of the acquisition side of the house on the government side. Going back to your acquisition days, not that long ago, are there examples you can think of of non-traditional companies having real success in programs that you were working on or associated with? And in those examples, was that success through directly plugging, plugging into the program or through partnership as a sub under a lead system yeah. integrator? Um, two comments real quick. One, Warren doesn't bring it up. Communities of interest within NAMSI for uh, vehicle protection systems and for uh, GCIA, if you're not part of it, if you're interested in understanding what's going on, I strongly suggest you become part of that because that's your chance to understand what's going on at the base level. I'm also glad to hear that the Raven's going to be cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> that so, wasn't the Raven. <laughs> <laughs> it was worth the trip just for that. <laughs> yeah. No, but, um, you know, so, you know, from my perspective, the, you know, small business, number one, small business and, and, and start, small startups, especially in the technology field, they have the great capability to bring some incredible technology that if you're just looking at the, the larger companies, they may not be developing because they, they found this niche capability that, that can be really powerful on the battlefield. Uh, we had an example of it yesterday, just in, and we ran into each other totally happenstance. I made a comment during, a, during one of the uh, um, breakouts. He came up and talked to me later. My, my director for business development, Chris Haig, back there is with me. He goes, hey, I've been trying to get out, get in touch with you guys. And then he showed me what he had, and I was like, holy cow, I want this. And that's, that's really the way we've found a lot of our smaller business, smaller capabilities that we can integrate into the system, into our vehicles. Um, one of the keys, though, is that's got to be open from the start. It's got to be mature. Um, and, and tying into your other question in terms of, of program management and, and from the Army side is the time to come to a PM is not when he is past milestone B and working towards a PDR or a CDR because <laughs> the baseline's kind of set. So it's got to be something totally earth earth changing, earth shattering, and, and be able to be a true drop in. Because it's gonna be very difficult to get BAE, Rheumatol, or GD to pivot on a major architectural change and still keep schedule and cost. So it's really important to get in early on the development of it, stay well in touch with the CFTs, because they're the ones looking at that stuff in the future and generating those requirements and, and understanding what's in the possible out there so they can be part of the base requirements document. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any great experiences or, or not experience. I don't have any bad experiences either. But in the case of AMP, AMP was a very mature program when I came into it. Um, so the struggle there was there were some, lots of opportunities out there, but every one of them involved somehow changing that architecture, yep. delaying the program, or increasing the cost of it. Those were three things that I was not allowed to do. And I would get browbeat by the CFT. <laughs> frequently to make sure that we stayed on track. CFT, Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, everybody else. So that's the important part is you've got to get in early to the program or into the capability. Stay in touch with the CDIDs because they're still a source of information about what's going on in the world and what the capabilities are looking for. CFT. Sorry, I forgot my initial, I'm a oh. former nuclear engineer, no acronyms. What's the CDID? Capabilities. Capability, development, integration, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the Maneuver Center of Excellence, that's where they're, that's where when, when the CFT is done with their, their process of developing the system, and as, as General uh, Norman spoke earlier, AMP-V was handed off to the ABCTA, um, or ACMA, is that what they're called now? Yeah. They, they've had multiple names. Army so, Capabilities Manager. Yeah, Army <laughs> Capabilities Manager. They used to be called TICMs, Carry.Capabilities Capabilities Manager. Yeah. So anyway, but uh, stay in touch with all those people because that's where the requirements generate. The PM is unfortunately, unless he's very early in the program, like uh, like Jeff Duran was prior to phase two of OMFE, that's the time to bring that stuff out because that's when it's easily incorporated. Once you started designing a vehicle, if it require if it's just a bolt-on or a drop a drop in is a better way to say it because we don't want to applicate this stuff because that does get very messy. So that's really what's going to be critical for small businesses, and startups to, uh, to to get into systems is it's got to be easily integrated. If it's not. That's where the struggle will come and the difficulties come. Yeah, so, so maybe a, a general observation from that for the, the newer entries into the defense industrial base in the room is it's really incumbent on you to understand how the acquisition process works from concept development to requirement development through acquisition. Because if you, if you don't understand that, you, you don't know where you're plugging into the cycle and there are points at which it, it's not going to happen because people are concerned about cost schedule and performance. Yep. 
and delivering the product and not incremental changes in performance. Um, let me pause and go to questions before I keep asking them and violate my own rule of listening to myself talk too much. Um, any questions from the audience? Hi, um, Adam Chitwood, I just retired from the Air Force a few months ago. Uh, both in uniform and now in industry, I've seen one of the biggest problems with the, the SIBR program is that even a successful SIBR project does not translate into a follow-on um, contract, et cetera. What I'm hearing from y'all is the best way for a small business to leverage that is to then just go subcontract with the larger companies. Is that kind of an, an accurate summation of what y'all have said? I would say that is definitely one way. I mean, I, the way you just described that problem is the valley of death that usually exists between development of an effort under uh, 6 one, two, six, two, six, three money and actually getting into 6.4, six, 6.5 six, into a vehicle or system. And it really comes down to how mature is it when it, when it exits there. Yeah, is my that, experience has been Air Force in which the, the cyber people are separate from the traditional acquisitions people, so the, you know, none shall the two pass type of thing. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I don't know what the Army's like, so. I, that's, it's not dissimilar. Let me, let, me, let me ask the question this way to you, Mike. During your time on the acquisition side of the house, um, uh, how often did you encounter the SBIR program, and how instrumental was that to you in delivering any capability? We did not. Most of the time, I would say the SIBRs, and correct me if I'm wrong, probably go through the, uh, the DEVCOM, Developmental Command Area, the GV, uh, Ground Vehicle System Center, the Armament Center up at Picatinny. Um, that's, that's where they go to to decide whether or not they want to take them farther. But like I said, it gets to that valley of death. And then the, the struggle on the valley of death, and this discussion I've had with so many people so many times, you can't bring a capability or, or a box or something to a PM who is getting ready to go into production of prototypes. It's like trying to build the plane while you fly it. Not a good way to do it. Um, and that's, the, that's been one of those struggles. It's, it's identifying maybe the right place to insert that is in, you know, the A1 version of whatever it might be. Yeah, we, we don't have anyone on the stage from the Army Applications Lab, um, so I'll try and channel them for a second uh, for you. Uh, the SBIR program historically has been an R&D program. It's lived on the R&D side of the house, and that's true across all the services. So you had science projects that were interesting if the money was useful to you as a company in developing a product that you were going to do anyhow. So now you're taking non-dilutive government R&D dollars instead of dilutive investment dollars in order to fund that work. Um, if you were trying to actually build a product that was going to get fielded by the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Space Picture Service, like completely useless. Um, but it's a lot of money. It's a, what, a billion and a half, $1.8 billion a year, give or take, spent on the SIPR program. So what has happened over the last couple of years as you've seen this emergence of what they call the DODX uh, community, so Defense Innovation Unit, Army Applications Lab, Naval X, AFWorks was sort of one of the leaders in all of this, is those organizations have said, how can we use these SIPR dollars more effectively by building on the front end a coalition within the service of stakeholders so that there's someone from the acquisition side of the house who's involved, so that there's someone from logistics thinking about how this is going to play out, concept development, requirements, you have all the right people so that if a program gets traction, there's someone there to catch the ball. So the, the challenge now with the SBIR program, I think, is you can't just think about the SBIR program. It's like just thinking about the Army. There's a bunch of different armies doing different things. You have to look at the specific program and figure out which of them are connected to transition pathways and stakeholders and which of them are still one-off R&D grants. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Corey. I work with uh, Archimedes Defense, and we build high-power systems for a variety of different vehicle types, and so we're a very non-traditional contractor coming out of uh, California, kind of Silicon Valley background. And uh, one of the things that we found, I think, building on, on your earlier statement, is that there's a kind of a very clear differentiation between companies that are working sippers. I mean, there's a lot of sipper factories out there and truly innovative companies building products. And I think Part of the issue is there's the gap between SIBRs and deployed programs, where when you look at the acquisition process, it's just essentially is antithetical to a 
to an iterative development approach that most startups are taking, um, where they want to have a capability that they are building towards versus being specified how they're going to build that capability and having to lock down requirements at an early stage and build towards that. And one thing the Air Force has done fairly well is built a, this new Agility Prime program, which we're participating in um, by, by our commercial entity of kind of a stage past the zipper of actually building a sandbox for low rate acquisition of commercial derived platforms. And so actual real contracts for fleets of vehicles that are test fleets, they're not huge fleets, but uh, a real path beyond a zipper. And I'm just wondering, I mean, JSOC has done this to some extent with their non-standard commercial vehicles program. Space Force is doing that when you look at some of the developments in SATCOM and, and areas where the commercial industry is just actually far ahead of kind of dispense specific capabilities. Is, is there any uh, effort in the Army to look at going beyond the SIBRs and research projects and building a sandbox for procurement of commercial-derived capabilities that to, don't necessarily follow the same procurement pattern, but are instead, we need this capability, we don't care how you build it, let's uh, just procure a small test fleet and learn about this capability. Um, if that made any sense. Or maybe if I could go to you, just based yeah. on your, your past with the cross-functional team, how did, how did you look at that? Well, I, I think, um, you know, a, a couple different views, I guess. I mean, certainly the idea of getting those technologies in a place where it's not just a science project, but instead is more focused on a, a requirement, a deliverable requirement is, is a task that I think we all um, strive to and somewhat struggle with as well. And, uh, you know, even in my, in my current role, I mean, one of, the, one of the interesting aspects, I guess, about where we sit is that it's very much being driven by, we have, to, we have essentially two main customers um, that we work with in the government. One is the folks in the science and technology community within, you know, primarily the Ground Vehicle Systems Center for us. And the other side, which really makes up about 60% of the work that we see comes through the program managers who instead are looking for ways to more aggressively solve some of their challenges that they have. Um, the, not all program managers are well, um, see the, the cost benefit um, of using something like an OTA as others. But I think in some cases, you can look at a very specific problem that they have, be able to put it through, again, through like an organization like ours, and then be able to more aggressively um, uh, be able to solve the problem as opposed to starting from a new contract or some other mechanism. But uh, that is maybe one way that, that they're helping to solve that. And they can do a very, I mean, we're competitive in nature. So everything that we do is, we don't do sole source with the exception of phase three servers that we do sometimes, but everything else that we do is very much focused in on bringing competitive answers or solutions to some of those problems. So um, again, it's very directed towards a particular need that a, a customer has. And I guess that's kind of how we see it um, in our end. So in, in my, not to get into too much, but in my past life, you know, we did some work with, uh, actually with AAL on a couple of things. And the challenge like you brought up, Mike, too, is like, hey, if, the, if there's no money on the backside that a PM was willing to pony up, then it's great. It's really cool to do it. And we walk out of it all feeling good about ourselves and, you know, big slaps on the back. But if we don't have that transitionable path to a need that a PM has and willing to put the money behind it, which, yeah. you know, we can talk all we want, but if there's no dollars associated with that next part, then, you know, we've, we've, we've increased our level of, of learning, but that's about as far as we've gone in many cases. Yeah, the, the, the one asterisk I might put on that is I have seen some benefits where that R&D money was specifically used to inform, de-risk, and accelerate the development of requirements. Absolutely. So that if you're participating in that and helping to shape the requirement development process, you're positioning yourself well for future competition, but it's, it's effectively a separate program. And I think, does that bring us up to time? Yep, yep. Uh, <laughs> so thank you, gentlemen, uh, David. Thank you for, for leading this incredible panel. Um, now that I'm an AAL guy on the stage, the, the only thing that I, that I would add to, to the conversation is, um, is, and this may not have been obvious, but you are looking at our SBIR process right now. The, the Vertex event, which didn't exist up front, um, was developed along this whole process where, where, we, where we shepherd companies through we have access both to, to SPIR, but also to, uh, to RDT&E 6.3. Um, Vertex is a critical component. Component, and if you look around, you know, we talked about the CDIDs, we talked about uh, CFTs. I mean, we have government stakeholders here now 
because we are trying to, to do that stakeholder build. And that was one of the, the lessons learned up front was, um, you know, to, to the point of the gentleman up here, is that that, that thing has to have a, a home at the, at the end of this, you know, or it's just kind of like a fun exercise. So the, the very first thing that we do, excuse me, when we receive a problem set, is we spend about four to five months on pure stakeholder build across the, uh, the transformation enterprise so that we can find a home for, for that thing. Sometimes when we get to, to the end, um, it may not be at the, the right TRL level, so it, it may have to go back to S&T. Oftentimes it transitions to a PEO, then I think one of you touched on it. Um, nearly in every case, it will at least inform requirements for the, those, those 2030 and, and 2040 kind of solutions. So that, that would be the, the sort of AEL uh, component to, to, the, yeah. to the discussion. So thanks again. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah. Uh, so we're, we're about to kick off for, for lunch. Speaking of, of solicitations, so um, Lieutenant Colonel McVeigh mentioned it this morning, but, uh, but this, this Vertex process does inspire and inform actual solicitations. So the, the last Vertex that we had was uh, Vertex Robotics back, in, back over the summer. So um, those two solicitations have just gone live this week. Some of them are, are probably relevant to, to the group here. So the first one is, is deep terrain shaping. The second one is uh, medical payloads for Army robotic platforms. And um, if you want to learn more, please visit aal.army and, uh, and, and search for our, our open opportunities so you can find out more. And, then, and hopefully, if you've got a, a, an idea or a product or a solution, uh, that you can you can submit through through that site. Um, last thing I'll say, and then I think we've got is Mr. Gary Patterson here. Okay. Um, last thing I'll say, sir, and then we'll, we'll bring you up, is as as you could tell. So this was not an, an open conference. So you are all handpicked to be here. This is a, a relationship that we're trying to build to help shepherd companies through that uh, that murky SBIR, uh, what we call a Spartan Cyber process. So we genuinely appreciate your time uh, here and, and all the insights that you've gained. And it really is a, a dialogue that we'd, we'd like to, to maintain. And, and when we're here, we're up on the eighth floor. Um, even if that garage door isn't open, that door is unlocked. Uh, so, so come in, and, uh, and, and we'd love to, to have some discourse with you. So gentlemen, uh, once again, thank you very much. And, and I think we'll, we'll bring on our AUSA chapter president. Yeah, hey. All right. Microphone and everything. Good afternoon. I'm Gary Patterson. I represent the Association of U.S. Army, our Texas Capillary chapter here in Austin. We're fortunate to be the home chapter for Army Futures Command and also for the National Guard here in Austin. Uh, we're a medium-sized chapter. We've got a little over a thousand individual members, but we have some great sponsors, uh, our community partners, which are our corporate sponsors and members. We have 50 of those. Uh, many of the companies are represented here today. I hope you've had a successful uh, conference. Uh, we certainly uh, appreciate what you're doing for the Army, for the defense community, uh, small and big, like uh, our community partners, those corporate members. We have everywhere from BAE, Northrop Grumman, IBM. I see some of the reps here. Uh, and we also have quite a few small companies within the area. If you live in Austin, I'd sure like to talk to you. I become a member. We have individual members. and. In and also, like I said, the, the corporate members. Uh, if you're interested, go to AUSA.org, because I know y'all are scattered across the country. I heard somebody from California. God bless you. Uh, we're, we're glad to have you. Uh, half of my neighborhood here in, in Round Rock has moved from California. Uh, but they're great Texans now. Anyway, just no, no harm. Anyway, just... Uh, Glad y'all are here, and we have barbecue. Uh, I consider I, I've been working with them for over 25 years. Uh, Pokey Joe's doesn't that sound like a good name? Well, okay. Pokey Joe's barbecue is some of the best in this area. They want to serve you, and please eat up because I had a good head count of 150. I don't see 150 here, so go back for seconds. Thank y'all. Appreciate it. All right. Hey, thank you, sir. Um, Thank you so much for, for catering to lunch. Uh, so breakout sessions will start at, at 2 o'clock, and they're listed here on the screen. And also, 
on the, the back of your, your badge for your QR code. Please enjoy lunch. Probably be, uh, be asleep after that, Pokey Joe's.